Good afternoon, everyone. Today is March 5th, 2020, and the special meeting of the Seattle City Council will come to order. It is 1.04 p.m. I'm Teresa Mosqueda, President Pro Tem of the Council. Will the clerk please call the roll? Peterson. Aye. Sawat. I mean here. <laughs> Sawat. <laughs> Strauss. Present. Herbold. Here. Juarez. Here. Here. Thank you. Lewis. I'm here. Here. Morales. Council President Pro Tem Mosqueda. Here. Six present. Thank you, Madam Clerk. So today, March 5th, is a special emergency meeting of the Seattle City Council called to order pursuant to the provisions of the Revised Code of Washington and the Seattle City Chapter. We appreciate all the hard work of those individuals who've been on the front line providing a response to COVID-19 or to the coronavirus. We applaud the work of our friends on the front line who are our firefighters and who are our police officers, those who are in public health as direct service providers and those who are human service providers working with our most vulnerable. Appreciate the great information that has been shared from Director Patty Hayes and Dr. Duchin, uh, Executive Dow Constantine yesterday at 1 p.m. in their briefing. This is a really important time for our city and our state, our region and our nation to come together to tr show true solidarity and lead by example. I think the work that we have in front of us today to make sure that the public has the best information possible about how to protect themselves and their family, their community from the virus is really critical and that we all take a moment to remain calm, take a deep breath and recognize we have some of the most expert public health officials in the county in our county um, who are represented right here, uh, the best of the country is right here. So we applaud all of their work. We also wanna take a moment to send our deepest sympathies to the families who's lost their lives as a result of contracting COVID-19. And I know many of us watching on TV or in the audience, we're looking for some certainty for a plan. There's a lot of things that are unknown still, but there's a lot of things that are known that public health will share with us and our good department heads will help explain to us. Many people are worried about their families and their loved ones, and we have shared repeatedly this week and last week that some of the best ways to help prevent the spread of the virus is by practicing good public health hygiene. Again, washing your hands for 20 to 30 seconds, avoid touching your face, make sure to stay home, period, and especially to stay home if you feel sick, if you are an individual who's had um, an underlying health condition or you have a chronic um, illness or disease or you're elderly like we heard yesterday, uh, please do stay home and appreciate, really strongly appreciate our executive, the mayor, and Executive Dow Constantine and their directive to encourage people to work from home and to telecommute and to make that possible. That is true leadership. So today we have a few items on our agenda today in terms of our special meeting. One will be to hear about this best practices and what our departments are doing in collaboration with Public Health Seattle King County and with King County as a region. We have, um, I'll turn it over in a moment to Council Member Herbold who will walk us through the first part of the presentation, who was to hear, we're here to hear from the department directors about what has already been put into place. We will then take a moment to hear from the public. I know there's folks here who would like to make some public comment. We will welcome that after we hear from the department directors as part of our presentation. We will then take a moment to um, go into executive session and we will also have then a, a follow up in terms of our conversation around the possible uh, ordinance that's in front of us. As you will note, and under state and city laws, the mayor is authorized to issue a proclamation of civil emergency when a public disturbance or natural disaster causes or threatens to cause personal injury or property damage. Because of this, the mayor has issued a proclamation of civil emergency on March 3rd, 2020 at 2.25 p.m. Once a civil emergency proclamation has been issued, the mayor can issue emergency orders establishing curfews, closing public places, and other orders designated to protect life and property. City code requires that the mayor's emergency proclamation and any emergency orders issued be filed with the city clerk and presented to the city council at the earliest practical time for ratification or rejection. The current version of the resolution before council would ratify the emergency proclamation 
Attached to the resolution is a copy of the proclamation issued by Mayor Durkin. Before consideration of the resolution, the council will be provided updates from Public Health Seattle King County per Council Member Herbold's upcoming uh, panel presentation. And then we will have the opportunity to consider this proclamation before the committee wraps up. So that's our agenda for today. At this time, I'd like to invite um, members of the Public Health Seattle King County Department and City Department leaders to join us, and I will turn it over to Council Member Herbold to lead us through the discussion with opening remarks. Thank you. I think I'll uh, begin my, my remarks as you join uh, the uh, committee table. Um, I want to just really thank you and let you know how grateful I am that department directors, um, both from the city and the county and leaders who are here to share with us the best information that we have about responding to the coronavirus, what individuals can do, and how the city is working hard to impact, uh, to contain the impact of COVID-19. There's a lot that we can do as individuals and as an institution to stop the spread. And simple steps can be really powerful. Seattle and King County announced earlier today 20 additional confirmed cases in King County residents. This brings the total number of confirmed cases to 51, including 10 deaths. As more laboratory capacity for testing comes online, more tests and results will be reported. However, King County has indicated they will not be routinely providing details about each case at this time. And we can hear more about their thinking um, for why that um, is, is a, a best practice um, as we move into the presentations. We all have uncertainty about how best to respond. And what we're trying to do now is we're trying to limit that uncertainty to ensure that people do not take actions that not only might not help us, but could harm us. As we've all heard, the best precautions we've heard from public health officials is to stay at home when you're sick, cover your coughs and sneezes with an elbow sleeve or tissue, frequently wash your hands with soap and water for 20 seconds and sing that happy birthday song. Um, if you're in King County and you believe you were exposed, stay at home, contact your, guard, uh, your doctor or the uh, coronavirus hotline. That number is 206-477-3977. You can make that call between 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. This is a really critical moment in the outbreak in this region. In an effort to slow the spread and transmission, King County Public Health has made recommendations in consultation with the Federal Centers for Disease Control. And this is all based on the best information that we have currently to protect the public's health. Right now, those recommendations include not holding gatherings of more than 10 people, staying at home if you're over 60 or have underlying medical conditions, and working from home if you're able. The steps we take now will have a tremendous and far-reaching impact on the lives of people in our community. As of noon today, the City of Seattle um, has encouraged all city employees to telework effective immediately, and using the city's alternative work arrangements, COVID-19 guidelines. Coronavirus doesn't recognize race, nationality, or ethnicity. Discrimination based on ethnicity or ancestry will make the situation worse. Many of us work in places with easy access to hand washing stations and can use sick and safe leave or access health care via insurance provided by our employers. Or if we're sick, we can stay home care for a family member, or get in to see a doctor the same day that we have symptoms that concern us. And that's not the case for everyone. And that's another um, area that I know council members are interested in hearing um, from our panel presenters about how to address those issues. Our first responders, fire, police, nurses, doctors, caregivers, public health scientists, they don't get to call in sick. The teachers, staffs, and, and custodians who are asked to stay behind and sanitize the schools while their t students and many of their p parents stay home during the exercise, they don't get to stay home. And the folks who provide us services that we rely on, perhaps even more so at times like these, those who hand us the sa hand sanitizer, who deliver our grocery, our online orders, or drive buses, or carry our mail, who prepare our food, 
It's their job, and they do it because no one else can. And they risk their health and safety to keep us safe, too. And I want to recognize and thank them for that. And I want this conversation to um, have the needs of those people um, as, as a focus as well. We must take this health crisis seriously. We're going to hear from um, uh, folks who are on the front line about the actions that they are taking. And there are several steps that have already been taken. As mentioned earlier, um, there um, has been the decision uh, not only on the part of the city of Seattle and King County government to encourage telecommuting, but many of our largest employers are also um, telling their workers to, to work from home. The mayor has issued a proclamation of civil emergency as uh, Council President Pro Tem Mosqueda uh, uh, referenced earlier. King County Executive Dow Constantine also issued a state of emergency, enabling extraordinary measures to fight the outbreak, including waiving some procurement protocols and authorizing overtime for King County employees, among other powers. I want to thank the Office of Immigrant and Refugee Affairs for translating uh, coronavirus information into multiple languages, and the public can find that information on welcoming.seattle.gov. The county has also started to set up quarantine sites in multiple areas throughout the county using portable trailers. This is critically important. The executive has indicated that King County is also in the pro uh, process of purchasing a hotel to use a quarantine site. The mayor is also announcing, um, I believe either has announced or will be announcing later today, um, the location of some additional um, tiny village sites as well. We've been told that the city's navigation team is distributing hygiene kits and sharing information on COVID-19 with people who are living unsheltered, and we look forward to hearing uh, more about that. The Seattle Times has also lowered, deactivated their paywall to ensure that all of our neighbors have access to the latest information and updates. And Washington State's insurance commissioner has issued an emergency order today directing all health insurance carriers through May 4th to provide health care provider visits and coronavirus testing without co-payments and deductible payments to enrollees who meet criteria for testing. So for those who have health insurance, cost should not keep people from testing or health care. But again, there, are, there is the reality that we're faced um, that uh, testing, it has to be directed by a doctor and there are people in our community who do not have access to doctors and don't have access to any insurance. The University of Washington announced that they now have permission and ability to test for coronavirus and the region could possibly test up to 1,000 samples a day. This is a significant expansion in our testing capacity. And public health officials throughout the county have been very consistent on keeping the public up to date and sharing information on how we can remain healthy. And they're giving daily media updates to the public. Their website has a helpful fact sheet and answers to frequently asked questions. I thank them because I think one of the most important things that we can do for the public is about um, providing that consistent and frequent message um, that we're all rowing in the same direction and speaking the same language. I would really, um, uh, again, I want to welcome our presenters and I want to thank you uh, sincerely for being here. Thank you for the hard work that you're doing to ensure that the city is responding with all of our capabilities to keep Seattle safe. Um, and I believe Senior Deputy Mayor Fong is going to kick us off. Oh, thank you, Council Member. Uh, would you like us to do introductions before we begin? I think a round of introductions and then maybe um, if you could just let us know who we're going to hear from first. Sure, That'd be absolutely. Great. Mike Fong, Deputy Mayor. Earl Nelson, Acting Director for the Office of Emergency Management. Hello, I'm Dennis Warsham. I am with the Prevention Division of Public Health Seattle and King County, and we oversee all the infectious diseases. Good afternoon. Casey Sixkiller, Deputy Mayor. Jason Johnson, Human Services Department. Andres Mantilla, Department of Neighborhoods. Ben Noble, Budget Director. Bobby Lee, OED. Barb Rath, Recent Retiree from Emergency Management. Kuvu, Director of the Office of Immigrant and Refugee Affairs. Jesus Aguirre, Parks and Recreation. Harold Scoggins, Fire Chief. Thank you. Okay. So good afternoon, Council Members. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for inviting us today to provide an update on our uh, public health and concurrent operational response efforts related to COVID-19. Uh, and I want to especially thank Council Members Mosqueda and Council Member Herbold. Uh, I understand that 
You know, we had originally been scheduled to brief the council yesterday. I appreciate the flexibility you've given us in the context of a very dynamic situation uh, that our team is responding and reacting to in real time. So the opportunity to have that flexibility and reschedule for today uh, is much appreciated. Um, as you know, um, the uh, um, public health response and the stand-up of the um, uh, Health and Medical Area Command uh, has existed since last week of January. Uh, subsequent to that, the City of Seattle has been in uh, pandemic response planning for much of February. And this past Monday, we activated the Emergency Operations Center. Uh, important to just remind uh, everyone that our this is not our first experience with pandemic response, and we are building off of our previous experiences and lessons learned from H1N1 in 2008 and 2009, and the existence of uh, the work that the Office of Emergency Management carries out uh, on its regular uh, mission and purpose allows us to be able to respond nimbly and flexibly while updating our continuity of operations planning in a way to be able to, to work and respond quickly and effectively uh, to the current uh, situation. Situation, excuse me. Um, so this afternoon, uh, we will uh, start with um, um, Dennis Warsham, who will provide you some context with regard to uh, the latest situational awareness from public health. And then subsequent to that, we have a series of presenters that can provide you context with regard to our concurrent city operational response. I assure you that our alignment is in lockstep with public health. And because of that, uh, I, um, uh, re you know, per hour, uh, the context we said at the beginning of our discussion, uh, De uh, Dennis will have to depart after his portion of the presentation, if that's fine with all of you, so that he can return into the field and do the important work that he must do in the context of public health. Absolutely. Appreciate you being here. Great. So with that, unless there are any questions uh, about the table setting here, we'll go ahead and turn it over to our team. And, um, uh, and I will um, play the role of facilitation here to kind of move the conversation along, if that, if that helps. Okay. That's good. Dennis? All right. All right. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. I'll just tell you, I've been so head down with my team that uh, coming up for a moment, uh, like pulling my head together, hopefully uh, we'll uh, be able to uh, provide some things that are helpful uh, and give you some current updates. Thank you so much for the summary. Uh, you took all my talking points, and so uh, we'll see how, where, we, where we go with that. Put your microphone a little bit closer. Yeah, absolutely. Mic. Thank you. So I, just from a public health perspective, you know, I think uh, one of the things that we do in public health and we do well is what we call surveillance. And surveillance is really about our data uh, collection and able to tell when we have something going on within our community. Uh, we rely uh, on that data for a variety of sources, uh, public health labs, uh, larger commercial labs, uh, through doctors uh, and medical community re doing reporting. They're mandated to do reporting. And that surveillance tells us kind of in real time where we're at. We're in a unique situation at this time. Um, this is unprecedented in my career, and I've been in public health uh, for 27 years uh, with what we are doing and responding to at this point. Uh, I will also, just in the context of uh, reminding people, because I think um, it's important to, to remind people that this is a novel coronavirus, and novel in the sense that we are learning every day a little bit more about this virus and, and transmission and, and what, it, what it goes. So what I'm presenting today is really to ground you in what we know today and uh, what is our best thinking today and our best strategies based on a variety of things. And so, uh, so uh, we'll see where it goes and we'll continue to update you. And we appreciate you being ambassadors in this process with us because uh, in order to be where we need to be in the community, it's gonna take all of us as a collective in order to do that. So I really appreciate the colleagues around the table uh, who are doing that. Uh, Sorry that Patty couldn't be here tonight. We are all, are today, we're pulled in a thousand different directions, and so I'll try to give you my uh, best from on the ground. Uh, we've been in activation, as it was said, uh, since, since January, uh, when we first heard of the, the virus breaking in China, and uh, really thinking and watching what that was gonna be doing, and how it was gonna, uh, preparing for if it should, uh, or when it would, uh, hit the shores here within our own country. Uh, we were, uh, we've been the first on a couple things in the state of Washington to have the first confirmed case and now unfortunately uh, have the first deaths uh, that are occurring uh, from this virus. The, um, 
our heart goes out, you know, when we talk about numbers, I just want to remind we're talking about people and we're talking about families. And so everybody's impacted about this in a different way. And we uh, oftentimes get into our space and we think broad populations. And so just not to lose uh, track that uh, these are people and, uh, and people that we care about in our communities. Um, it's important, uh, I think, for what I can share for an update, uh, I think it was already doing, but just to reemphasize that, uh, currently uh, there, in the state of Washington, we have 70 confirmed cases and 11 deaths. Here in King County, uh, we have uh, 51 of those, or 51 of those uh, cases and 10 deaths. Um, the epicenter hit in one of our most vulnerable places within our community is in long-term care facilities and uh, unfortunately uh, has uh, taken the life of, of, of many uh, family members uh, from, from that community within that life, life care center over in Kirkland. Um, it's, it's, it's tragic, it's unfortunate, I but I think in, in text that we need to keep in mind here as we see these numbers of, of these 10 deaths in King County, uh, all of them are related to this healthcare facility other than one. Uh, so that the epicenter is pretty focused and quickly spreading. And so I uh, want to just keep that in, in context to numbers of, of, of a bit of a reality. Um, I know that most of you know because you're following the media um, and uh, following uh, public health and our website, uh, but I, it's also every time we get an opportunity is that 80% of the people who will come in contact with this virus are, are, are going to receive it in a moderate to mild uh, thing, just like a, a typical regular flu. It's the 20% that have underlying health conditions that are over 60 years old uh, that are the most impacted uh, from, from this virus. So uh, in public health, we, in any reportable condition, our goal is to do what we call contract tra uh, contact tracing. In our surveillance system, we get reports of cases. We then follow up. We do an interview with those people. Uh, we then figure out where they've been, if there's businesses, schools, other things that we need to notify, we do that, and as well as we try to follow up with every contact uh, to be able to, to shut the disease down as quickly as we can. As this disease grows, our, our strategy is gonna have to change. Uh, and um, we, we talk about it in public health in two fields. We talk about it in containment and in mitigation. So the containment of the virus is about how do we stop the spread and not contain it as best we can so that there isn't uh, a wide community spread. Uh, in the area of mitigation is once it's out of the box, is then what, how do we mitigate it as best we can. <clears throat> From our modeling and where we're looking at, we decided very quickly, look, knowing what happened in Wuhan and other parts of the world, is that our mitigation strategies were going to have to come fast and hard. Uh, and we have implemented those and we're implementing those as we go. The important thing and unfortunate thing is, as we know, of, of government officials and trying to be responsible to the communities that we serve and the people that we serve, is we usually want to take time, do community engagement, have people weigh in on what these mitigation strategies are. We're doing our best with the information we have. We have an equity and social justice officer who's sitting with us. We have ethicists sitting with us, really helping us to make these decisions as best we can without doing a full process that we would normally do as a public health and a government agency. So we're gonna get it wrong sometimes. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna step on toes and I'm sure we're gonna uh, overstep sometimes, but we just really ask that you join us and be a partner with us and, and help us. And if we have a blind spot, bring it to our attention and let's work together on what we need to do. We're moving as quick as we can to, in order to, to really mitigate the strategies of this work. Uh, in our contain let me just kind of bucket those two things in containment and mitigation and talk a little bit more in detail about both of those components. In the mitigation strategy, in the containment strategy right now, we are uh, getting our lab results. We're trying to follow up with everybody who's reported. It's, uh, it's, the state lab has only been operational in our state since last Friday. So we're not even a week into this. Uh, and so we're, our, we're trying to build these systems in real time in order to be able to do it. And the numbers are coming in rather rapidly and with incomplete information, which makes it harder to do our contact investigations and containment. We've done a really strong and hard uh, reach and look into the, the long-term care facility and the best that we can do within that environment and the healthcare workers. Uh, the people on the front line, not only are the public health folks who, who are working hard and around the clock to do what they, they do, uh, I will tell you when this broke uh, on uh, over the weekend, uh, we had a staff of probably 35, 40 that were in the office, and I had 100 people show up that weren't assigned and asked what they could do. So 
people are showing up and doing their jobs. Uh, so you should be proud of your, your public health system. Um, the, uh, the, around the containment strategy uh, with the Life Care Center and all of the health care facilities uh, that have been transported out, as people, as they get, as uh, residents are not able to be cared for any longer in that facility because of their, their worsening conditions, they are moved out into the hospitals uh, in uh, the community and, and in a variety of places. And, uh, and of course, that puts uh, our health care workers uh, also at risk risk and exposure to these areas. So, um, so we're trying to work, prioritize our healthcare workers, our first responders, and, um, and the people who are, we're getting early diagnoses on. Those are our, those are our primary focuses in the containment of, of this work. In the mitigation strategies, we're really trying to implement, uh, we oftentimes, these are called, in the public health world, they're called non-pharmaceutical interventions. With, at, with the absence of medications and uh, vaccines, uh, what we try to do is we implement the best strategies. The messages, as you've heard here, wash your hands often, social distancing, um, elbow bumps, maybe we've got to be careful about shaking hands, uh, and a variety of other things. When you're sick, stay home. Those are all typical mitigation strategies that we put in place around anything where we know uh, that, especially that's airborne or that is droplet. With this particular virus, we know it's droplet form. And so covering your cough uh, and, uh, and uh, stay home if you're sick are all the messages around mitigation. We've taken a bit more aggressive uh, steps the last couple days around some of the community mitigations, asking that if businesses and government agencies can have people telecommute, they should be home telecommuting uh, to really isolate and separate uh, folks out so that we don't spread the virus if it's in our area. I, I will... Um, probably shouldn't be so adamant, but it's gonna show up in your work environment, it's gonna show up with people we know, and uh, so we need to do our best to mitigate this in every way uh, possible. We are asking people to reconsider, these are all recommendations, we're asking people to really consider about community gatherings and what those numbers need to be. Uh, the number you heard earlier was 10, I will tell you there's no magic number. Uh, we, uh, it's a number that came out uh, uh, as one suggestion, but I think you have to look at that a case by case and really take those into consideration and make decisions what's best for you and your community and those, where those gatherings are happening. Uh, so, um, so 10 is, we, we got pushed on what is a large group. Uh, and that's a hard that's a hard thing to respond because there's context with every one of those that we want to consider a little bit differently. We're also looking around community mitigations, and we're trying to get sector based. And uh, we have uh, deployed. Uh, I've lost, uh, I don't know what's happened in the last two days. Uh, we had 17 people show up on Monday from the CDC. They're here building policy with us. We are the epicenter of this in this country. We are building policies and recommendations in real time. And, uh, and again, those are gonna change. And so we're grateful for them and they've been really helpful in this process. We have the best thinkers and the best experienced people working with us in these areas. So we are, we are thinking by sectors. We're thinking about schools. We're thinking about business environments. We're thinking about a, a large uh, gatherings such as sports arenas. We're thinking about uh, people who travel through airplanes and ferry boats and everything that we can uh, to build a really sector-based approach so that it is the most helpful advice that we can give. Uh, those are rolling out uh, as best we can, as fast as we can, uh, and, and there'll be more coming out. Uh, the school-based recommendations we're hoping will we'll roll out today. Uh, and uh, we are working today, uh, we are working with the CDC, finalizing up around homelessness and shelters and what is the recommendations that should be happening to help guide what happens within our shelter environment. So again, really being built in real time. So these are some of our mitigation strategies and really try to, try to stop the spread of disease. Colleagues, um, I know there's a number of people who have questions. What I'm hoping is that we can get through the presentation from each presenter, and then we'll offer ample time for each of our colleagues to ask a series of questions. And I know you have a time constraint, so we want you to get through your presentation. And then to our council colleagues, I'll make sure that we go down the line and folks get their questions answered. Okay, I'll just hit one more area. Then I, maybe it's better to okay. stop and just answer questions because I want to make sure I'm getting what you need. Uh, a big push from everyone uh, is testing. Mm -hmm. And so let me tell you a little bit about where we're at in testing. Um, uh, this, this is probably one of the hottest questions uh, right now uh, that we get through our call center. Um, so I so just want to set a context is, again, brand new virus. Uh, quickly developed uh, an ability to test for this virus, uh, and when it came on through CDC uh, um, um, not a few weeks ago, uh, we really had to prioritize who were the highest risk and who we thought would be at risk. We needed to really uh, hold 
uh, the people that we thought needed to be tested who, from an epi perspective, were most likely to be infected and could be carrying the virus. And uh, it, as I said last Friday, we pushed those testing kits out. We've been uh, able to do that now at the state lab. They are operationalizing about 200 tests a day. And as reported, UW has now made uh, their uh, contribution in uh, setting up their labs, and we'll be bringing it up to 1,000. And we are really pushing for commercial labs to follow. And my understanding in an earlier briefing today that there are a number of commercial labs that will be coming online. So testing as a whole will be uh, more accessible for folks, and they should be working with their healthcare providers uh, in determining uh, if they uh, need to, to do that. I will say that it's an important thing to say, because I think it helps quiet the fear a bit, is the treatment, di the treatment after a confirmed case of COVID is no different because there is no way, there is no medication that is a dedicated medication or a vaccine for COVID. So we treat it like other aggressive respiratory illnesses, and we work with medical providers in order to do that. So I understand the urgency to test for people, but they should, if they are having symptoms, those symptoms are worsening, they should be working with their medical providers, and those pro medical providers uh, will be attending to them based on what their health needs are at that time. So I'll stop there and uh, I'll be happy to answer questions before I go, if that's however you'd like to go. Well, we really appreciate your time and thank you for the detailed summary of all that you have been up to. I know that um, your team, your front of the line team have been working 24 seven. So please extend our huge amount of appreciation for both your team and Director Patty Hayes. Um, first, Council Member Herbold and then Council Member Morales. Thank you, and I'm just gonna ask both of my questions and um, uh, maybe what we could do is just get the get all the questions out and then you could answer rather than I, I'm just suggesting that what, might, yeah go ahead and then we'll be a little um, faster you assume my brain is still really mm -hmm. working well <laughs> okay all right all right uh, anyway you want to do it um, so when you were talking um, about um, the containment strategies uh, you mentioned that um, you were working to follow up um, with f folks who had um, with whom you had had contact. Are you referring to, because it, people um, are getting referrals for testing from their healthcare providers, but they're not coming to you. Right. So when you said you're following up with your contacts, who, whom did you yeah, mean? Thank you, thank you. So the way that the public health system works uh, throughout the country is there are what we call uh, mandate, ma uh, diseases that people are mandated to report. Mm -hmm. They are re required to report that in two ways, a, a confirmed lab test, or a medical uh, community, whether it's a, an individual provider or the uh, facilities themselves, they're mandated to report the results of a test. And uh, we get that information through an electronic uh, process. It's called the Washington Disease Tracking System. And we are able to see a positive in, the, in that system and we get the person's information and phone numbers. So and when you said contacts, you meant people um, who have been positively identified as having the virus. Right, and then we talk to them about who they've been in contact with in order to be able to do the quarantine and mitigation strategies. So, um, how, how, you'd mentioned that you're, uh, it, it, it sounded as if you haven't gotten through to all those people yet. Is, is, that, is that accurate? Yeah, that's, that's accurate. We, uh, we are getting, uh, this is the, one of the part of the systems that we're trying to improve is some of the results that are coming in is, is when we move out of the public health system only doing the testing and we move into the broader community, uh, the, the Seattle flu study has, uh, as you know, found uh, a case that was our case it was reported up in Snohomish County uh, through their process. So we're working with all of these different systems that are out testing as to making sure that they're using complete information about the individual and how we contact them. Not everything has had complete information, so we have not been able to follow up on all of them. Okay. Um, so what percentage would you say are as uh, outstanding? No, I would say the majority of them we've been able to follow up okay. with, but there's right. a few that we're struggling with. All right, there. and then uh, moving over to specifically testing, um, you know, I think it's important to place this in the context you mentioned um, that, um, State testing has only been up since last Friday, um, and in the United States, I thought saw reported. I think there's only been 600 tests done in the entire United States. Um, but I would still like to know what your estimate is of the number of people who have been tested in King County, and given that the CDC's recommendation for testing um, is not just that. Um, 
everyone can get tested. It's that everyone who has a referral from a health care provider can get tested. What would you recommend to folks who don't have health care providers? And, and yeah. if, if that is a barrier, how, how can we work together to make sure that it's not a barrier for people who are presenting symptoms and don't have a health care provider to make that recommendation? Yeah, that's a, that's a tough question and a, and a good question. I mean, I think there's a society we have struggled with that for a long time, but people who don't have health care providers, and we've been wrestling with that as a city and a state for a long period of time. Um, I would say at this point, my best advice is if you do not have a health care provider, we have community health service clinics that are spread throughout. We have a great system here in Seattle and throughout the county, and they should be working uh, to get into those facilities in order to be seen. There's going to be a briefing with them. If it hasn't already happened, uh, it's happening this week, uh, and getting them to stand up and be ready for that. So we, we don't want to turn people away who have health care needs. Uh, the, just to your point on the recommendations, uh, I want to be really clear is that there are things that we can actually screen out. And if people have flu-like symptoms, there's actually a flu panel that we can actually do to tell you if you're positive for flu. When moving to the coronavirus testing, it's when nothing else is showing up as positive is that we then go to the, that particular area. So there's a way that the medical community is responding in order to be able to screen those out mm -hmm. uh, through a process to really make sure that those who are symptomatic, those who have illnesses uh, and have reached into the healthcare community, that they are getting those tests that they need. Thank you very much. Council Member Morales. Uh, so I want to follow up a little bit on this re testing related question and then I have a different question. Um, so you mentioned that you're going from being able to test about 100 people a day to hopefully 1,000 if the UW mm -hmm. has increased capacity. Is there a similar increase in capacity for the actual testing the lab results and lab capacity? Yeah. Um, that's one question. And then um, We've been talking about, you know, what size groups to limit, and 10 was sort of sounds like a random number. Um, as a mother of a child with 26 other kids in her class, uh, I'm sure lots of families are eager to hear what the school recommendations are, um, and we know that that will put burden on families if their kids aren't in school, especially if they have to work and don't have the ability to stay home. Um, and if we're talking about protecting public health, we know that kids are vectors for all kinds of things. Um, and the teachers and other school staff are also need to have their health considered. So um, I'd love just whatever additional information you can provide about uh, when the school report will be ready. Yeah, so uh, for those who tuned in yesterday to the briefing, uh, Dr. Duchin addressed this question uh, uh, from, and it's in our press release. If you've not got it, I want to make sure that everybody gets a chance to get that and we can follow up with you uh, on that particular piece. I think the thing that we're learning about this virus is right now worldwide, it's not affecting children. Uh, we don't know if they're carers. We don't know. We don't know enough about that. But it's not affecting. It's really affecting people who are 60 years and older and people who have underlying health conditions. Now, if a child has an underlying health condition, that puts them into a different category. One of the things we learned about H1N1 is it was actually disruptive to the system when we closed schools down. And so the recommendation from public health at this point is we do not close schools. Uh, if we have a confirmed COVID uh, within a school system. We will, we will work with that school district, and if proper, we will close that school that district down for cleaning in, in those areas. So at this point, we're not asking for people to, to close schools down. Uh, one of the things that we see that happens in that environment, as you can appreciate, is when you have working parents, especially uh, in a variety of our healthcare arenas, if they have to stay home, it pulls them out of our first responders, it pulls them out of uh, the arena of our health cares and our systems, and we need them there. And knowing that the children have not been where we have seen uh, critical outcomes uh, around death or even uh, strong hospitalization uh, is uh, we're not recommending at this time that schools are closed. We're working with them on mitigation strategies about what can you do to keep your environment cleaner, make sure that uh, proper hand washing, gel, sanitary, all those things around uh, uh, helping to mitigate within those environments, but at this time, not recommending closing schools. And that will be consistent uh, unless something really changes based on the disease that we know currently. Uh, to your question about the testing, the capacity, uh, the state reported yesterday that they've had no backlogs uh, in their testing, so I think that their capacity is currently there. And I think uh, now with the UW coming on with 1,000 a day, I can't speak to their capacity, but I think if they're operating and standing up 1,000 a day, they've built their teams in order to be able to respond to that level. Uh, we'll see what is unfolding in real time, so I think we'll keep an eye on that. But I'm feeling better uh, that more capacity is coming online. It, it helps us uh, get it out to the community and the people who need those testing. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. Um, I have a few questions as well. Um, when we talk about the mitigation strategy, has public health put out recommendations for how many hand washing facilities per um, population units that each city should have in our county? We, uh, I can go back and look. I have not been any of those conversations that we have put out recommendation out. I know that there's been some conversations internally here. Uh, it sounds like for, I was told before coming over, but, um, but uh, we have not put out that recommendation out at this point. Okay, great. Yes, I think that came from me. We're very interested in additional portable hand washing facilities across our city as a mitigation strategy. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the incubation period? If an individual feels that they had come in contact with somebody who may have been sick, how long do you think that it would may maybe take for somebody's symptoms yeah. to start showing? Good, good question. So uh, again, science uh, in real time. Uh, what we're seeing is uh, is that we're telling people to quarantine for 14 days. It's 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 we've had onsets uh, as early that we've seen here around you know four or five days, uh, and some that are even later than that. So we're telling people two weeks uh, is that if they've come in close contact, it's most likely with people who are gonna be in close contact with somebody who is a known case. So it's a, oftentimes with a family members uh, in facilities where there's constant, you know, a number of hours that they spend with folks uh, are probably most likely to be able to become infected. So we ask them if they've been in contact with a close contact that they quarantine themselves, home quarantine themselves uh, for 14 days. Okay, thank you very much. Um, another question about communication with some of our providers. I appreciate Councilmember Morales' question about schools. Uh, is there any specific protocol to any of our preschools, early learning facilities, and perhaps some of our colleagues later, you don't have to jump in right now, but put a note that we're interested in how we're communicating with our SPP providers and CCAP providers. Any specific directive to those who are on the younger um, age? Yeah, so, yeah, thank you. That's, thank you for, that's a good question as well. Uh, so I will say that the School guidance is coming out is from preschool to college, so it's a it's not just uh, K through 12. Okay, and what about zero to three? Any specific guidance? Uh, zero to thirty. Three. Oh, zero to three. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> it's a big group. Is it, are, there, are there thirty years? Still, I guess there are many still in school. So, uh, so uh, yes, uh, I don't have anything on the zeros yet. Okay. I, I just really focused on preschool, schools, uh, age kids, and uh, and adult learning uh, okay. environments. Okay. Um, one quick comment, uh, as we talk about making sure people stay home if they feel sick or if they need to care for a loved one, we want to remind people that they have paid sick and safe days in the city and in the state. Um, one area where we know that people can access their paid sick and safe days if they're not feeling sick is when their school is closed by a public official. One thing that we'll potentially be bringing forward and would love public health input on this is making sure that we amend our city statute as well so that it doesn't have to be closed by a public official for the parents with in a school or a childcare facility to get access to those paid days. That's great. Um, thank you. And because, you know, a lot of these schools, we saw maybe a dozen or so, um, both uh, early learning facilities and schools close out of an abundance of caution, which we appreciate people are taking the steps to keep their or, uh, facilities very clean in light of the uh, virus. But we want to make sure that those parents who are working parents anywhere in the city know that they can access that paid sick and safely. Yeah, that's a really good point. You know, we, we advise, we, we're giving these recommendations out, but as you you know, uh, it's the school's authority to be able to make that decision uh, that what they want to do in abundance of caution and to protect their kids. It's their, it's their call. Uh, we are happy to advise and help uh, navigate and talk about that uh, with them. Excellent. Thank you. And then I think the last question for me, if the council colleagues have any other questions, um, given the news that I think is spreading very fast when um, an in, uh, individual is identified with coronavirus, for example, we're finding out from Twitter um, when somebody has a virus and Amazon sends out an alert. That's great. I'm glad that they're encouraging people to stay home and taking public health recommendations. Um, what is the private sector's responsibility for notifying public health in addition to what you mentioned about individuals? How does the private sector as businesses inform public health of when there's an outbreak or not an outbreak, uh, I'm when sorry. They have a case. wrong word. Well, if the public health system is working as it should, we should know before they do. Okay. Uh, so uh, again, uh, if they are a confirmed case, those lab reports are should be coming to us. And, uh, and uh, the thing that uh, sometimes they're a little ahead of us, if we have, uh, for example, if you have a large employer that we notify an individual that they are uh, positive for COVID, uh, then um, uh, they may be reaching out to their employer before we're able to get to their employer to let them know. And again, you know, this is gonna be fluid uh, and changing. If, you know, when we talk about if we're up in the thousands, uh, the communication becomes more difficult uh, in sequencing. 
Colleagues, any additional questions? Um, I, I will note, I appreciate the proactive response that public health has had along with the partners in King County to identify isolation. I have a question, Chairwoman. Oh, thank you, Councilmember Member Juarez. Yes, I hear you. Chairwoman? Yes. I have a question, Council Chairwoman. Please go ahead if you're watching. Hello? <laughs> she's on mute. You're on mute? We're on. No, we can hear on. you, Councilmember Member Juarez. Go ahead. One second. I, if you're watching on TV, Council Member Juarez, I can still hear you. Okay, I got it. Okay. Um, I know I appreciate the questions that you've asked to focus on the children and the vulnerable populations, but I wanted to know what we're doing for outreach for our elderly community. Thank you, Council Member Juarez. Yeah, uh, so um, I will... We have a, uh, it's called the community mitigation team that is t together and working on recommendations as well as outreach. I haven't sat in that call center to know where they've done specifically. I'll tell you where my attention has been, is really working with long-term care facilities across our, our county and within the city, is to making sure that they are using uh, the best precautions that they know in order around infection control within their environments. So uh, our most vulnerable uh, that we're concerned about because of the congregate setting and the ability to spread easily is within those long-term care facilities. So my attention has been there. And we have uh, some community teams that are together and really developing strategies, again, Again, really looking if the 20 percent who are most vulnerable are 60 and older and people with underlying health conditions is they're developing how do we reach into that community how do we educate them how do we get the information they need council member juarez do you have any additional questions oh. council member Mosqueda, no thank could, you very much council member juarez if i just might add later on in the presentation we uh, can pro provide a little additional context in terms of what the city of seattle is doing with regard to our outreach and engagement efforts. And, and obviously um, the, the focus populations that you've referenced are ones that we have um, keen interest in making sure get the information that they need. And, and Jason Johnson and others at the table will, can speak to that a little bit more a little later uh, in our presentation, so. Okay, wonderful. Colleagues, any additional question? Council Member Juarez, thank you for your question. Um, again, thank you so much. Um, Mr. Worsham, we are appreciative of the isolation facilities. We're appreciate, appreci we appreciate the containment strategies. I know that public health is always interested in doing as much community engagement as you possibly can. And during these times when you're trying to act as fast as possible, please know that you have my full support as uh, someone who's worked in public health in the past. I think this council wants to be as supportive as we possibly can. Obviously, you've been working in close contact with the executive team at the table here. If there's anything we can do to help support you as you roll out additional sites or strategies, especially for the um, elderly and for those who are working in long-term care facilities, as well as any others who are working with vulnerable populations, as I know we'll talk about later, please let us know. We really appreciate your work. Yeah, thank you so much. And with that, we will let you run if you need Bye. to. Thank you for your thank time. You. Okay. As uh, uh, Director Warsham leaves the table, I will add uh, our appreciation, the mayor's appreciation for Director Hayes and uh, Dr. Duchin's incredible work. Uh, they have been uh, working around the clock, and certainly public health has been doing an incredible job uh, in terms of managing uh, the situation. So with that, um, the next uh, element of our presentation today, we wanted to shift now to the city's operational response. And we'll start with Acting Director uh, Laurel Nelson for the Office of Emergency Management. I uh, wanted to make sure we shared a little bit of the structural contours of how uh, from the World Health Organization on down to CDC to the Department of uh, Health at the state level to our local public health agencies, just structurally how that apparatus uh, works at a high level. And then separately, having stood up our uh, emergency operations uh, functions, wanted to make sure we level set a little bit in terms of uh, how we're organized. And and I'll take a moment to acknowledge that we, we've also invited back to the table former uh, director Barb Graff, uh, who has not left the region yet, and we should lean in on the fact that she is one, of, with her 40 years of experience in emergency management, we have one of the nation's leading experts on emergency preparedness in our backyard. Uh, we should certainly tap her expertise while we still 
have it. So, uh, so Barb is able to uh, help us answer some questions today as well. Uh, and with that, and also with the leadership of Barb and Laurel, we are one of the few uh, accredited emergency management programs across the country. So we should be very proud of the work that, that they have done and the work of the entire cabinet to date. So with that, Laurel, if you can provide some context. Great. Thanks, council members, for allowing us to be here and, and share uh, our story. So uh, first off, I want to acknowledge not only the work of my colleagues here at the table uh, and the first responders, but back in the emergency operations center behind the scenes are all the staff that are working very hard on a number of these missions and ensuring that we're responding effectively to the community needs under this situation. So um, as many of you have been briefed, uh, the Office of Emergency Management is really responsible for coordinating our citywide capability, and that involves the planning that we do on an ongoing basis. Um, since uh, 2007, the city has had a pandemic influenza incident annex. And um, with that, when we faced the 2009 H1N1 virus, uh, we took that plan along with exercises that we had conducted to help guide our uh, response then, and it's helping to guide our response now. Um, since 2009, uh, we have constantly used interdepartmental stakeholders to be able to do our ongoing planning, and that continues to be what we're doing today. The city has good muscle memory when it comes to good principles of good planning. So it's something that we do year in and year out, and so we've already got that great network with our colleagues to be able to do that planning. So with that planning, it helped us jumpstart our response for what we're facing now with COVID. Um, as Mike mentioned, or Deputy Mayor Fong mentioned, um, there, this is an international response, and from the World Health Organization down to the CDC, who then guides what happens at the State Department level, uh, State Department Health, and then down to our Public Health Seattle King County, we have to be lockstep with our local public health, and we have been. Um, we have great working relationships with them, and uh, with that, we have also got an Office of Emergency Management staff member embedded in their health and medical area command and have been doing so since the middle part of February. So we are in concert with them when it comes to our planning and response. Um, in addition to just drawing on those um, planning efforts, many of you know, and we've been here before, Barb has been here before, I'm briefing you out on after actions on previous activations that we have. We leverage those experiences each time to build upon what we can do to be able to be nimble and adaptive, and this is a scenario that we're having to do that. Um, all of our COVID planning and preparation, as I mentioned, is reliant not only on the Public Health Seattle King County, but also on the Northwest Healthcare Response Network and our hospitals. So uh, on an ongoing basis, we have dialogues with all of our stakeholders. Uh, those stakeholders are in constant meetings with us annually on a monthly basis in our, our committee meetings that we hold. So those relationships are already there. So as Deputy Mayor Fong mentioned, since mid-February, um, the Office of Emergency Management has le been leading the citywide planning effort to get us prepared for COVID response. Um, and that's involved a number of factors. So I just want to share with you some of the things that we've been doing since mid-February and then transition to what it looks like and what we're currently dealing with. Um, so since mid-February, uh, we've been doing every Tuesday planning meetings where we bring people down into the emergency operations center. Uh, we had, um, I believe, nine mission areas that we were focusing on, all elements out of that existing pandemic flu plan that I mentioned that was dated back to 2007. Um, with that is a, a huge focus on what we do as a city to ensure continuity of operations for our different functions and essential functions. So uh, we have convened folks and working on those particular plans. Other strings of uh, missions that we've been working on is our workforce resiliency. So how do we ensure that our workforce can come to work? What does it look like when they get sick? What does it look like when we need to take care of the hygiene practices, facilities that, um, that may be uh, faced with having a COVID uh, positive uh, individual in that environment? In addition to the COOP plans is really the, the backbone to that is what do we do from the IT side, the information technology side, to ensure that we can support teleworking. So that looks at um, all aspects of Skype meetings, conference calls, um, and we do a lot of conference calls, and I will just say the Seattle Squeeze was a great opportunity for us to practice that, and we really, again, create a great muscle memory um, with that. We have to be prepared for a scenario of possibly upwards to 40% of our workforce being gone. 
And that um, goes back to those continuity of operations plans. So over the last few weeks, our departments, not only do they have a basic COOP plan, but we've asked them to go back and look at how they're going to operationalize those. So when you look at the critical staff that need to do the functions of keeping power going and keeping water flowing, what does that look like? And then what can we do with the other employees who aren't necessarily in those critical roles, being able to support them for teleworking? So, you know, we're looking at not only um, all the population that we need to serve in, in the city of Seattle, but we have to make sure that all those services, the emergency medical services, our fire response, our public safety, again, the power, the water, the, the solid waste, the, the wastewater system, all of those things, we have to make sure um, they are functional. So all the city departments, especially our core operational departments, have those continuity of operations plans in addition to the legislative department also has your own continuity of operations plan. Um, other key strategies that um, you've probably seen today were the teleworking, um, looking at social distancing. So we, even though we haven't been officially um, required to do social distancing, we've been practicing that in the EOC. So what does it look like if we need to um, be in the EOC and we need to spread people um, apart and be able to do that social distancing because work still needs to continue? Um, HR, our, our human resources department has been doing a huge body of work to make sure that we have our workforce ready to go and we can support them in a whole plethora of ways um, to make sure that they, they can be taken care of. I'm going to let my colleagues in um, with Deputy Mayor Six Killer and Director John, uh, Jason Johnson talk about the, the initiatives and the focus that we've been doing on um, vulnerable populations. Uh, we are lockstep when it comes to the communication strategy, and thank you for continuing to echo all those positive strategies that we as individuals can take out in the community. But again, um, we need to be lockstep with public health, and we have done everything we can to keep amplifying those messages out into the community. Uh, we've been working with the business sector, so you'll hear from my colleagues, um, Director Bobby Lee, um, to, to hear what's going on in the, the community as well as in businesses. Um, in February, I also want to share with you, we were already leaning forward on what it would look like if we had to open up the Emergency Operations Center. So we were already strategizing, planning assumptions, and having a, con a concept of operations of what that would look like. Obviously, we're in that mode now, and as Deputy Mayor Fong mentioned, we are currently activated right now, Monday through Friday, 9 to, 8 to 1 a.m., um, to do. And again, we're trying to practice not having a lot of people in a space um, and you know, looking at what that's going to look like. Um, with that, I will share that we are also looking at what it may look like for a virtual EOC. Um, we may be at a point that we need to look at how do we do coordination calls and how do we do Skyping and doing those types of meetings beyond having people physically in one space. So just to give you some idea of what we're focusing on currently in the Emergency Operations Center, clearly, um, and this is a thread, no matter what activation we do, we have to maintain op, um, situational awareness. So we're looking at all those data points that allow us to paint the picture of what's going on out there and try to be ahead of the curve as best as possible. So how are we tracking absenteeism of our workforce? Uh, what uh, critical facilities are closed or open? What are the impacts to the community out there? What is the the call volume at the customer service bureau, what are our call volumes at our 911 centers? In addition to that is this um, close relationship with public health. How can we support them and coordinate them with them as closely as possible? Uh, the third objective that we're focused on is, again, just amplifying in every possible venue, avenue that we can on what those messages are for our community members. The fourth objective we're focusing on is just maintaining city services. Again, that goes down practically down to the departments and what they're doing with their COOP plans. A, first, uh, a fifth uh, objective is focused on safety and security of our at-risk populations. And again, you'll hear from my colleague, Director Johnson, on that. And then our last one is we have to be nimble. Um, so our sixth objective is how do we address and identify any policy issues. One of the things that we always teach in the Emergency Operations Center is um, we have to be able to leverage the brain trust of the people that not only are in the Emergency Operations Center, but also our colleagues in other departments and agencies and organizations. Um, we are going, this is a novel situation, and we have to be nimble and we have to be adaptive. So. Anyone can bring a great idea to the table that can help do that problem solving for, for those particular solutions. 
So I just want to touch, uh, there was a question about um, schools and daycares. So the Department of Education and Early Learning has been in the Emergency Operations Center along with the school district. Um, so DEAL um, has contracts with well over 197 daycare centers and 84 preschools. And they are in the contact with those preschools and with the schools to make sure that we understand what's going on with them and what those impacts are. Um, I will also just share with you, we've been reaching out to all of the college systems and understanding what's going on with the college systems and maintaining that as another data point on what uh, they're seeing for their student population um, and how they're having to adapt their operations depending on what they're dealing with for, for COVID. With that, that's my piece. Thank you. Um, Councilmember Herbold. Thank you. Um, just two questions. Um, the first being that the uh, mayor's communication to department directors on March 1st um, uh, talked a little bit about um, the con uh, continuity of operations plans and identified um, a, a goal of March 13th to have those plans operationalized. Um, has that date been reevaluated? It seems a little far out, far out, but I don't know everything that operationalizing the plan, uh, what all that uh, is consists of. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, we are staying with that date. And a lot of work has already been done, Council Member Herbold. Um, they just need to look at for, for instance, you may hear from the chief talk about more tactically as they look at their workforce, what does that look like on them needing to pivot their operations if they lose, just like Kirkland's lost 25% of their workforce. So what does that look like for the fire department? What does that look like for the police department? Um, what employees do not need to be field responders? And um, what do we do with them for telecommuting, et cetera? So uh, I think a lot of work is already in the hopper and, and going successfully. We just um, will keep with our, our March 13th date at this point. I'll just add, Council Member, um, uh, to just add a little bit to Laurel's comments. The, as we've stated multiple times, too, that the dynamic is I mean, the situation is dynamic and we are reacting in real time. For instance, the, the new public health uh, recommendations offered yesterday uh, initiated uh, around the clock discussions by the executive with regard to new guidance that we were providing to our city workforce with, and, and supervisors and managers with regard to some of the provisions that, uh, that you saw uh, from our um, guidance earlier today. So, so I think my short answer is we will, we will be pushing aggressively to, to, for folks to conclude their continuity of operations planning. But as with everything in this current situation, deadlines are shifting uh, in real time. Yes, so. Thank you. And my second question relates to the um, snapshot report out of the um, Office of Emergency Management and the, um, the OEC um, operations uh, from, and this is a snapshot report from the uh, third, um, at four o'clock. Um, there are um, a couple issues that are related that have been um, identified as common uh, concerns across all departments. Um, one of those being, um, and, and I think they fall into um, OEM's bailiwick, which is why I'm directing the question to you. Um, concern about management of resources um, uh, and specifically cleaning supplies, um, as well as having a common set of standards on policies for cleaning yep. for each of the departments. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, as you can imagine out in the community, we're already seeing um, Perel and, and all kinds of products go off the, the shelves. So in the Emergency Operations Center, we have the Finance Administrative Services representing our logistics section. So we're looking at how we centralize ordering of supplies, um, and those include those type of hygiene products and cleaning supplies. Um, FAS has also been working in concert with human resources to address um, how do we effectively uh, retain the uh, cleanliness of our facilities if for any reason we have a sick employee or we have a positive um, COVID tested employee within the city. So they are looking at their contracts and ensuring that we've got those types of service contracts in place to be able to do and support those missions. So um, just 
do we have, this was um, uh, identified by all of the departments as a concern um, a little less than two days ago. So do we have enough cleaning products now? And do we have a common set of standards for cleaning across all the departments? We, we have a common standard uh, set of cleaning parameters. I don't know about enough supplies. Um, they are, they've been doing inventorying as well as trying to centralize all the orders that we have from the different departments. I, I can't tell you off the top of my head what we have for actual quantities at this point. Okay. Yeah, and, and Councilman Herbal, I'll just add in, uh, in some ways this may be a perfect segue into, into Chief Scoggins and um, some of the first responder uh, aspects of this, but um, I think what we'll hear throughout this conversation is that uh, in terms of supplies, whether it be uh, cleaning products or for our own city facilities, but also per personal uh, protective equipment and other, th other things for our first responders are part of a global uh, discussion that we're looking at. And, and frankly, uh, these are dynamics that every jurisdiction across the country are dealing with, and there is going to need to be some support from the federal and state level with regard to some of these aspects that I know Chief Scoggins uh, can speak to as well. So, so we, can, we can get into some of that here. Uh, yeah, and I just flagged this because because this is something that is listed under all departmental concerns. I, uh, I, I totally appreciate the unique concerns of our first responders. Yep. Yep. Um, and Director here. Goings, I know, is working on this very specific question right now as we move, we actually are exploring the conversation very actively in the OC about centralizing purchasing functions in order to get uh, a little more um, coordination and a more real-time understanding of the precise question you're asking about. Before we move on to Chief Scoggins, I, just a quick follow-up question to that, if I may. Um, when we look at the number of supplies that we either need or are currently lacking, I understand you maybe want to get back to this with that type of data um, pursuant to Councilmember Herbold's question. Can we also ask those who are using the cleaning supplies in our buildings if they have the supplies that they need? When I was walking in and I saw folks who are cleaning our first floor yesterday, I asked, do you feel like you have everything you need? And it was sort of this deer in the headlights look. Um, I think people don't know what they necessarily need. I am concerned about those who are cleaning our buildings. We know it's not airborne, but given the type of work they do with um, potentially water splashing and other things, I think it would be helpful for them to have masks. Um, similar, I'm not a healthcare expert, but just I think asking our public health uh, officers if they think that those th that are doing the cleaning also need that type of um, supplies would be helpful. And then Council Member Herbold may have asked about this, but can I ask you a little bit more directly? Is there anything that the city can do to, uh, in partnership with the Attorney General, to address the price gouging of cleaning supplies for our public? Anything that we know of that we've been called on to help with? Councilor, that's a great question, okay. and um, we'll flag that as something for our team to, to discuss. And um, if there is something specific, we will uh, we you. will engage you on it. Yeah. So, um, if it's okay, we can move on to. I, I do think Chief Scoggins has some important information to share with regard to our uh, the work of our first responders, and uh, perhaps we can flag a few few questions that have come up that you might be able to address as well. Sure. So, good afternoon, members of the council, and I'll give you an overview from the first responder perspective. Um, as always, I think it's important to start off with thank yous, and there's a lot of thank yous to our public health partners, um, been engaged in many phone calls and conversations to make sure that we're doing the right thing as we serve community. Our King County EMS Director, Michelle Plord, and our King County Medical Director, um, Dr. Tom Ray, as well as our own do our medical director, Dr. Michael Sayer, they have been providing the oversight and guidance that we need to make the decisions for our responders out in the field. Um, and most of all, thank you to our first responders, not just Seattle, but all over King County. Many of you heard that um, three agencies in King County, Kirkland, Woodenville, and Redmond, have firefighters under quarantine because of an exposure. Um, that just goes to show that first responders do not stop responding. They continue to go. And sometimes you can't see what's going to um, get you from time to time, but you still go and try to serve community. Um, on the pandemic plan, we're in stage three of our SFD pandemic and infectious disease plan. And I'll be talking to through what that exactly means for the Seattle Fire Department because it assists us in our planning and our, our coordination. Another thing that you should know, as of um, this past Sunday, we've stood up daily conference calls with all of our King County Fire Partners, all the chiefs around the county, to make sure we're moving 
in one direction together under the guidance of our medical direction and our EMS director to make sure that we're serving all the members of the county. And I got to thank all of my partners out there throughout the county, all the fire chiefs who are truly engaged in trying to make sure that if Kirkland has 25% of their workforce under um, quarantine, can that city still get the services they need delivered? And, and we're circling up to try to make sure that happens. You know, one of the first steps in our, our um, pandemic plan in, in, in stage three is to make sure we review all of our training procedures throughout the department. And we have a real time team that has been doing that, modifying that, changing that. And this week we've started rolling out our train the trainer and moving through the entire organization. Even though we've had this training many times, we're doing an active touch on every firefighter in the organization to make sure they're retrained on our policies, procedures, and donning and donning all of these, um, all the PPEs they need out in the field. Earlier this week, the Seattle Police Department, they participated in that training with us, the train the trainer, so they can also engage in um, training their people. And that's important for us. The impact for us could be very real. And just to, to give you some, some stats on what this looks like for us, about 12 to 1,300 calls per week would fall kind of under this umbrella that could be this type of response. About 100 to 130 calls per week are respiratory related, and that's per week. Um, and that equals about 4,800 to 5,200 calls per month that could fall under this umbrella. So that becomes very important for us that we're paying attention to it. Since we've been monitoring this since the middle of January, we've sent out four communications to the Seattle Fire Department um, on progress and changes that we have been made been making. Uh, we've modified our dispatch procedures three times now under our medical direction to make sure we're asking additional questions. And that becomes very important for us when that call comes into the 911 center. We want to try to equip the firefighters with as much information as possible so they don't walk in blind to what they could be facing. So we've continued to expand that. And we haven't done that alone. We've done that in partnership with NORCOM, which dispatches for the North and the Eastern Agency, and Val Valleycom, which dispatches for the Southern and the Eastern agencies in King County, along with Seattle Fire Dispatch. Just yesterday, the team got together, had another meeting with our medical directors, and, and we pushed out another change as early as this morning. That's, that's very important for us to try to equip our people with the right information. We've given our crews a, a direction on what to do when they arrive on scene and different things are taking place because we could miss one along the way. Um, we, we could not get correct information, which happens quite often. So we needed to have a game plan for that, for our crews to make adjustments on the fly, out in the field. Um, we need to have a plan that if our uh, public safety partners in PD, um, if they're walking into something, we need, be, need to be able to pause them from walking into it, hopefully equip them with what they need so they're safe and they're protected. And that becomes very important. We've given guidance on transporting patients, um, you know, and, and thank you to the public. Uh, I should say that we've been following the public health guidance and we've been broadcasting um, a lot. If, if, if you have a, a fever or cold, please do not use the 911 system for that. That's not what the 911 system is built for. The 911 system is built for those traumatic emergencies that we face, cardiac events, strokes, all those type of things that we deal with on a daily basis, but not for the cold and the flu type scenario. And, and what we've seen is we've been tracking our calls over the last eight weeks and they have not um, spiked. So thank you to community for paying attention. But for those patients that we do respond to and they may have those symptoms of a code or a flu, we're talking to them on scene to identify if they have a primary uh, physician, have they contacted that primary physician and to try to connect them up that way. And if we do have to transport a patient to the hospital with these um, signs and symptoms, what we do is we put a call in ahead to the hospital that we're going to so they're prepared to receive the patient so they 
have as much information as possible so they can provide that care. Uh, we provided direction on decontamination of crews and equipment. That's something that's very important to us since we're dealing with the public on uh, many times a day and, and there's a process. CDC does give guidance on um, decontamination procedure and, and we're following CDC's guidance. Um, whether we're de deconning equipment, vehicles, um, uniforms, or any of those things, we're following the best, best practices that are out there. And then exposure concerns. Um, we're having open and honest conversations with our personnel. Today will be day four of our uh, department-wide meetings via Skype, and we're allowing our personnel to ask questions directly to our medical director, to myself, um, and to other members of my leadership team so they're well informed on all the things that they need to do. We have also been tracking our inventories, and that's important for us, and I spoke to some of the numbers. Um, if we responded to two of these, 200 of these, um, um, type of incidents per week. We have supplies for four weeks um, of, of full outfitted PPE firefighters responding out in the field, but we won't, we probably won't be responding to 200 um, per week. And then we've stretched that out to six weeks or eight weeks based on, you know, what the probabilities are. So supplies are very important for us. Um, I know we, as well as the police department, we have a, a, a lot of orders out out there um, because our goal now is to, to, to backfill all those supplies so we don't know how long this is going to go on and we just want to be prepared as we continue to move forward. Uh, that's all I have unless you have any questions for me. Thank you so very much. I know that um, some of our colleagues at the table do have a hard stop at 2.30 so we want to get to some of the questions around how we are serving a lot of the vulnerable folks that your members see every day, Chief. So thank you for that summary. Is there any questions for the Chief? Councilmember Herbal. Um, one of the questions I'd asked in advance um, is whether or not testing uh, on first responders is being prioritized. Um, the response we received is that yes, priority of tests is determined by the Washington State Department of Health in consultations for the Centers for Disease Control. Uh, and, and it refers to an earlier answer. But I don't, that, that answer did, didn't quite get for me, get, give to me the answer um, that I was seeking about given the, um, the testing protocols, um, how we, are, we make sure that first responders are going to the top of the list um, given the testing protocols that already exist. Um, and then um, uh, just a question I have is whether or not um, it makes sense to advocate to the CDC for a change in testing protocols as it relates to first refund, uh, responders. I'm a little worried that um, people have to be symptomatic um, in order to and, and get the, um, the uh, uh, referral from, from a public health uh, provider um, in order to get testing, particularly when it comes to our, our first res responders and considering that um, people are asymptomatic typically for, I think I've, I've heard a week. Um, so that's, a, that's another, I know we don't control that because these are, these are protocols that are set by the CDC, but whether or not we should be advocating for different ones for our, our first responders. Uh, thank you for the question, Councilmember Herbal. That's a two-part question. So will we advocate heavily if any of our people are exposed? Absolutely. Uh, we have the resources to do that, and, and I think we know the right places to go. Our goal is to take care of our people. On the asymptomatic piece, uh, you know, there's a caution there. We don't want to provide a false positive. We don't want a person to get a test too soon and it gives a false positive result and they think they're okay and a week later they start showing signs and symptoms and then they have to go take another test and then that one shows positive. So that's very important, the order of the tests and when we get the tests, enough of the virus has to be in your system for the test to actually be accurate. And if we test too soon, it could give a person a, a, a sense of false hope uh, and then they get sick a week later and then they've been, they've been released around their family, around their friends, back working, back serving community, and then we can have a, um, a domino effect for something like that actually taking place. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Herbold. Um, colleagues, any additional questions for the Chief? Okay, great. Um, Deputy Mayor Fong. Sure. So um, uh, next up is, uh, and I'll just 
comment that um, when we initiated conversations with the council, multiple council members raised one of the first issues that you have made a priority was our work with regard to communicating and engaging with vulnerable populations, refugee and immigrant communities, non-English speaking communities, and the mayor shares your uh, prioritization with that regard, and we have had a team working in this space for some time, wanted to provide an opportunity for them to share with you some of the work in that space, and then we would close with work that uh, Deputy Mayor Sixkiller and Director Johnson have been working on specifically related to uh, um, the homelessness uh, population. So, so with that, I'll turn it over to folks to talk a little bit about the outreach efforts. Great. Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor Fong. Uh, so from the Department of Neighborhoods, DON has served as a lead on our outreach and engagement efforts with uh, support and partnership with OED, who is engaging with small businesses and employers, as well as the OIRA, OIRA who is the Center for our Language Access Plan. Um, we are engaging with 14 specific non-English community liaisons to supplement the work and at the guidance of uh, King County Public Health to uh, extend our outreach in, in focus with non-English populations, specifically with senior populations. Um, and the, the, the goal here is to extend uh, already translated materials and provide interpretation of those materials um, and connect potentially uh, senior groups and non-English speaking groups into services and align with uh, King County Public Health. We are also working on regular uh, call schedule with our uh, multiple organizations, community-based organizations, nonprofit partners, uh, business organizations to provide uh, timely information and guidance, uh, again, in partnership with King County Public Health, as well as tracking um, uh, community events of all uh, shapes and sizes so that we're uh, accurately uh, uh, communicating that out to community. So I'll turn it over quickly to uh, Bobby Lee. Good deal. I, I'll keep my comments short, and if you have questions, then I can dive in. So the business community is pretty diverse, and so there are different universes within the business community that we've been interacting with. Uh, this morning with the hospitality industry, certainly this has been a disaster situation for them. And then, um, but in general, um, they, they do feel very concerned about how this is being played out, and they are, I think, moving much faster in some ways than public, perhaps the public sector in trying to address this. And we'll see this getting played out more often. The feedback that we're getting from small businesses and, and medium-sized businesses is really around access to capital, to have enough reserves to get through this. Um, the average small business, which would be a uh, small business defined as 50 employees or less, uh, their monthly uh, rent is about $9,000 a, a month. And so that, that gives you a reference point in terms of um, some of the costs that they would have to incur when they close. Um, and so we're, we're trying to find ways to provide more relief in terms of licensing and tax potentially, um, but also at the same time uh, look at federal funding because the, the, the Congress has passed uh, the $8.3 bi uh, package around this issue. So we're tracking that as well. One of the areas that we could immediately potentially move forward is the dislocated workers program for people who are uh, laid off from this situation so the employees can access training. Uh, the average cost for training is around $10,000 per employee on average. Um, we, will, we have directed my staff and um, Workforce Development Council to start moving dollars toward dislocated workers program. And that's some of the things that we'll be working right away to address a potential um, unemployment uh, rise in the near future. We're also conducting extensive economic impact analysis, and we've done some preliminary ones that just got sent out today. Uh, we'd be happy to share that as well. I'll leave it at that level for now. Any questions here? Right, um, before we move on, I, um, I want to just uh, make sure I understood what you said. Um, you believe that some of the federal relief dollars might be available uh, to address uh, shortfalls that small businesses are experiencing? As I understand it, the, out of the $8.3 billion, $1 billion is set aside for um, small businesses. Um, the, depending on how this gets played out, is, it could be a loan or maybe potentially even grants, but we're not really clear on that yet. Um, but the challenging part, and the mayor explained this morning, is, is the is the, the ability to get the money to the local folks quickly is the issue, is, is the time, uh, the ability to move fast enough. And so what we're gonna do is reallocate our existing federal dollars around workforce development. Meanwhile, um, 
uh, as, look as much relief on the on the taxes and fees and licensing, while we also try to uh, convince the federal side to move quickly on that one billion for the small businesses. Okay. Yeah, I just uh, received a, a message from a, a small business owner in West Seattle, um, and who who is spoken with other West Seattle businesses and they're seeing um, 20 to 30 percent negative year over year comparative sales whereas most were positive five to ten percent before um, the coronavirus hit um, and from their perspective a 25 to 35 percent sales swing will put many businesses out of business within two to three months I think that's consistent with some of the numbers that, that you named. Um, so I appreciate that you are um, looking to see what resources um, we have available for those small business owners, but as well uh, for uh, members of the workforce um, who are um, being told to go home. Thank you. I do, I do want to emphasize a point that, that Bobby has, has alluded to, if not spoken to directly, which is that we're looking at the federal resources because federal resources can flow directly to small, to individual small businesses because of the state constitution's restrictions on the gift of public funds and and, and lending. The city is not in a position to direct um, whether you thought it would be a good policy idea or not. You're not legally in a position to direct um, uh, relief to individual businesses. Thank you. And just council members, as we trans, uh, transition over to Director. Um, uh, Ku uh, Vu from uh, OIRA. Uh, I want to just second the impact that we're seeing on uh, businesses in the Chinatown International District and Little Saigon area. And as we look at and think through our language access plan, really um, extending the message around uh, the stigma associated with COVID. So please go ahead. And just before you begin, I, I do know that some folks may have to leave at 2.30. If there is members of the cabinet who have to leave, we appreciate you being here in case folks have to step out. And uh, I know that there's a number of questions, so appreciate the large group that you brought today, um, Deputy Mayor. Uh, council members, uh, Seattle is fortunate to have um, a immigrant and refugee office. Uh, we are just among a few dozen cities across the country to have a freestanding office. And with that, a couple of best practice, national best practice programs that we've deployed um, in this effort. One is our ethnic media program. Um, and over the weekend and to date, uh, we've uh, sent out uh, in language content to hundreds of contacts. Um, and uh, my uh, communications officer tells me that those contacts have reached an estimated 87,621 community members. And that's based on the audience size of those outlets. Um, we've translated public health guidance into 10 languages, um, and those have been posted on social media. That has been reposted or engaged with 3,655 times, um, emailed out to our list of more than 5,000 contacts. That includes community leaders, um, our Immigrant Refugee Commission, nonprofit staff, grassroots organizers. So a really concerted effort to get the message out there um, and help people understand uh, what the situation is and what they need to do. Um, another part of this is uh, language access. This is another best practice program that um, has been about uh, two, almost three years in, in the making. Uh, and here, uh, we're very lucky that we're one of the few cities in the country that has a full-time language access specialist. And we have deployed Peggy over to public health, have embedded her in the communications team there so that we can streamline the, the processes and um, leverage the efficiencies uh, to know that any product that comes out for public health can be utilized in Seattle and other um, parts of King County. Uh, and so we've committed for Peggy to be part of that team for the next couple of months, uh, to really lay a strong found, uh, foundation there. Um, we've been providing language access coordination for other city departments. Um, and so you'll begin to see across the city signs for the fire stations, for our front lobby in City Hall, for Seattle Municipal Tower, um, and the uh, Parks and Recreation Community Centers in language, in six languages, uh, telling people that if you have these symptoms, please take these steps. Uh, and then the last thing I want to, uh, two, two quick things, we've been providing technical assistance to Seattle Public Schools and how they communicate with um, families if there is a confirmed case in the schools. And then there is uh, some advocacy happening right now with USCIS 
uh, to stop the public charge rule in our region because they themselves have admitted publicly that that rule could lead to um, uh, the kind of situations that would make uh, our public health system worse. Thank you very much. Any questions? Seeing none. Please continue. Just uh, and Councilmember Muscade, I appreciate your comments. I, uh, Chief Scoggins and I do need to step away. Uh, don't turn it over to Deputy Mayor Sixkiller and, and Director Johnson. But before I leave, I just want to emphasize I uh, appreciate the Council's um, uh, um, uh, engagement around this topic today. At the same time, also appreciate your quick uh, consideration of the mayor's um, declaration, uh, proclamation of emergency. Some of the topics we've discussed today are very much central to the, uh, uh, the ability for the executive to remain nimble and flexible in, in our response. Uh, issues around purchasing and uh, uh, supplies speak directly to the emergency order. Uh, your reference to uh, potential price gouging is also fits directly into potential future um, uh, orders associated with our response. So appreciate your consideration. We look forward to working with you. And uh, with that, um, I'll turn it over to Deputy Mayor Sixkiller. Thank you very much, Deputy Mayor. Uh, good afternoon, council members. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, I want to sort of underscore, um, just uh, before I turn it to Director Johnson, a few, a few things. One is that, um, you know, we began planning back in early February uh, at the direction of the mayor, uh, uh, both preparation and beginning to think about how we would respond to, uh, to this type of outbreak among our vulnerable population. Uh, as we've learned more about uh, COVID-19, obviously we've begun to focus more also on, uh, on those over 60 uh, and uh, and others who uh, are vulnerable to uh, to this outbreak, and, and uh, but with a particular emphasis on on those who are living unsheltered uh, within the city. Uh, but as a uh, as a part of that response, though, has been working very closely with uh, King, uh, Seattle King County Public Health uh, and the King County Department of Community and uh, Human Services. And I just want to say, uh, uh, you know, having overseen uh, some of this work with uh, Director Johnson, I, I'm really. Uh, very pleased with the level of coordination we are doing with the county, uh, particularly with our homeless population. Uh, and that is uh, work that's been going on now for, for several weeks, uh, not just over the last couple of days. So we've tried to really take a, a, a regional uh, a, a approach here to our response and, and, and prep. Uh, Director Johnson will talk uh, through, uh, walk you through some of that. Uh, as I think you're beginning to hear, you know, we have uh, uh, the county announced um, its expansion of various shelter uh, units uh, here within the city. Uh, we earlier today announced our uh, expansion uh, efforts as well. Um, we also have made some other uh, decisions re regarding vulnerable populations, including beginning to curtail those programs, uh, especially, especially within uh, Seattle Parks and Rec uh, that are specifically designed. Uh, to serve uh, individuals that are 60 or older or uh, that fall in the category of vulnerable. So we are taking the steps um, uh, necessary to, to make sure that we're heeding the advice of, of public health. Uh, and but obviously this is an evolving situation, so we'll continue to do that as well. I also want to mention we are also working very closely with the Seattle Public Schools. Uh, both the superintendent and I have been in contact with the, with the district uh, as recently as this morning on some of the decisions that they are making. Uh, and we understand that they also are updating their guidance uh, just for general operations as well. Uh, with that, I'll turn it to Director Johnson. Thank you very much. And Director Johnson, thank you so much for being here. I know colleagues, you may have a number of questions. Again, I'm going to remind folks that I'm going to ask folks to hold till the end. So please keep a list of any questions that you have so that you can get through your full presentation. And then we'll go down the list if there are any questions. Thank you, Director Johnson. Appreciate it. Thank you. Good to be with you. Um, so uh, as you know, the Human Services Department uh, serves Seattle and King County's most vulnerable communities, providing specific, uh, uh, services specifically for people who are experiencing homelessness, for the aging community, as well as for individuals who are living with uh, disabilities and uh, uh, severe illness. Um, these are many of the same communities or same populations that are uh, now uh, facing 
is higher risk uh, from the spread of COVID-19. Uh, and so this uh, body of work has had my full attention uh, over the last few weeks, uh, in, a, a, and especially since uh, Friday last week. Uh, I've been leading a team uh, from the Human Services Department who's been working uh, inside of the EOC. We've been preparing uh, to update the city's pandemic response plan. We've also been asked to uh, uh, develop an action plan to manage COVID-19 impacts for people experiencing homelessness. So those are two bodies of work that uh, the department has been uh, steeped in over the last uh, uh, a few weeks. Uh, additionally, the Human Services Department Aging and Disability Services Division, which works with homebound individuals and people who need in-home care, uh, works, is working closely with the Washington State Department of Health and uh, Public Health of Seattle King County to ensure coordination and communication is aligned with uh, best home care practices and public health guidance. Specifically, uh, over the last uh, a few days, um, our department has been leading an effort to uh, ensure that there is good and aligned, consistent communication in support of our human service providers. Uh, and we do that in partnership with King County DCHS as well as with public health. Specifically, uh, we are making sure that we're all promoting the right information and that that information is consistent and that uh, providers are hearing from their funders in a consistent manner. Uh, we're also ensuring that uh, uh, all providers, especially those that are operating shelters, day centers, hygiene centers, uh, or any uh, congregate meal or other congregate kind of activities uh, are um, uh, very familiar with and in the practice of using public health's uh, hygiene and sanitation guidelines. Uh, and so we uh, uh, have a number of trainings, web trainings, uh, that we'll be uh, uh, doing with service providers, again, in partnership with King County DCHS and public health uh, uh, throughout the month of March to make sure that uh, all providers are familiar with those guidelines and are using those um, uh, precautionary measures inside of their, um, inside of their programming. Uh, we've also been busy over the last couple of days assessing what needs providers have, as well as assessing what their environments are like and if there are environments that are uh, at a, a higher risk of uh, a continued spread of COVID-19. Uh, so we have, uh, between the city and the county, uh, uh, quite literally been uh, uh, surveying every one of our contracted providers who offer uh, shelter and uh, day center hygiene, uh, transitional housing services, permanent supportive housing services, uh, to uh, try and assess the risk uh, that individuals using those programs are at. Um, and then finally, uh, the Human Services Department is acting as a central hub for information from providers. We want to know and have asked uh, 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 providers to be in contact with us immediately if they are going to change any of their services. Uh, so if they're going to reduce hours, if they're going to limit the number of people who uh, can maybe uh, access their facilities, uh, if they have any reductions in staffing, uh, et cetera. Those kind of items we're asking for folks to be in communication with us immediately so that we can help support them. Um, uh, we've also been uh, busy specifically on the homeless response. Um, so you uh, received information earlier today on our efforts to uh, expand uh, uh, the number of shelters that are available, uh, but we've also uh, been really pushing the hygiene and sanitation guidelines from public health and ensuring that people have the materials they need to uh, uh, follow those guidelines. Uh, we've been uh, uh, partnering, uh, uh, again, with King County DCHS and public health through our EOCs, both through the Seattle uh, EOC as well as King County EOC, to purchase the materials that we need uh, in order to make those supplies available to providers so that they can adhere to the uh, uh, hygiene and sanitation guidelines. We also want to make sure that uh, uh, outreach is um, still occurring for an, uh, a population of people living unsheltered. And we want to make sure that uh, we're not only pointing people in the direction of services that they need, but that we are distributing hygiene kits for individuals who are living unsheltered. Um, we have those kits. 
uh, now, but we know that we are going to be uh, there in high demand and uh, will soon be short on those hygiene kits. So again, we're uh, sort of expediting the purchase of those kits uh, through our EOC so that we can ensure that our outreach teams have what they need as they engage with people. Um, the third piece uh, that really has had our full focus and attention uh, has to do with uh, aging and, and, and disabled population. So our Aging and Disability Services Division uh, serves over 12,000 uh, 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 households across King County, providing in-home care and services uh, to those individuals. Uh, these are individuals who are vulnerable, uh, and that we want to make sure that uh, any of our case managers, any of their in-home care providers, uh, anyone accessing their home maybe to deliver meals or medication uh, is adhering to uh, uh, standards that keep those individuals safe. Um, so that has been a big body of work uh, over the last uh, few days. Uh, we want to ensure that continuity of services occurs. Many of these individuals that we're serving are homebound and cannot access what they need uh, without um, uh, relying on, on individuals to visit their home. And so it's really important for us, uh, both as the provider of this service, but also as the contracted partner uh, funding these services, uh, we want to make sure that people are adhering to uh, public health standards as they engage with individuals in their home. And then finally, I just wanted to flag that um, we are uh, very aware of the uh, risks for an aging population as they congregate in senior centers and at congregate meal sites. Uh, so we have uh, also uh, yesterday finalized some assessing of uh, all of the senior centers and um, senior congregate meal sites uh, that exist across the city uh, and, and, and county so that we can um, uh, begin communication with them, pushing out the same level of information that we have been for shelter providers to them so that they are uh, uh, practicing the safety measures that we want in place. Uh, but also we want to uh, uh, understand uh, what kind of shifts to uh, uh, programming they are making uh, given uh, yesterday's uh, uh, new guidance from public health. Um, so we really want to understand if there's any changes, if they are encouraging uh, individuals to not uh, use senior centers and congregate meals. And uh, we are doing some background planning uh, to ensure that if congregate meal sites should close or reduce hours uh, or reduce, have any reduction in the number of people that they can serve, uh, that we are ready to um, lean in and offer meal delivery services instead. So with that, uh, maybe I'll pause given time. Uh, I know that council has received uh, uh, several answers to many of your specific questions, uh, but uh, maybe I can pause there and see if there are any questions. Excellent. Um, well, first, thank you very much for providing answers to some of the questions that have already been presented and um, especially to the folks that we have contracted with on behalf of the city to carry out the city's function as human service providers and those who work with our aging population. Thanks to them directly for their ongoing work. Um, I know there's a number of questions, colleagues. I might just throw one out real quick. Um, Director Johnson. We heard about a 40% reduction in some of the Kirkland um, workforce population that was mentioned earlier uh, in the presentation. Do we have a sense from our direct service providers uh, working in the human services, uh, sorry, the contracted entities with our human services department, if they've experienced any significant reductions in their workforce from folks staying home yet? Yeah, so that's the uh, kind of information we are asking uh, to okay. be provided to the department. Uh, at this point, we're not getting information about their workforce um, uh, as far as uh, reductions or having a spike in people calling in sick or not wanting to be uh, in service to uh, uh, the, the community in their, their normal capacity. Um, uh, in fact, yesterday uh, I spoke with uh, Daniel Malone, executive director of DESC, uh, and uh, he uh, affirmed that uh, people are showing up to work. People are, 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 are you know, want to be uh, engaged and uh, understand the vulnerabilities that this popu specific, specific population have. Um, but he has not seen any kind of uh, workforce reductions at this point. Okay, Council Colleagues, Council Member Herbal. 
Thank you. Um, three quick questions. Uh, first, I would love just to know how many hygiene kits the navigation team has uh, been able to distribute uh, thus far. I understand that there's a, there's a need for more. It would be um, helpful to know how many have already been distributed and over what period of time. Um, also in the questions that you, the answers you provided to our earlier questions, you make note and you um, said so uh, in your presentation today that you're contacting um, our contracted uh, service providers um, uh, to help them um, make assessments around public health for um, their operations. One of the um, one of the items that's mentioned is um, that um, you're recommending um, that they deploy uh, hygiene and sanitation recommendations as well. I would love to know um, uh, beyond um, urging them to deploy these recommendations uh, for hygiene and sanitation. I would like to know what role the city's playing if we're providing any, um, any actual physical monetary assistance. And then lastly, um, uh, I've talked already about my concern that um, the ability to be tested is bounded by a uh, professional health care recommendation. Um, and I'm just, and so to me that what that means is largely it's going to be people who have providers contacting their providers and, and being able to get testing. Um, I'm wondering um, whether or not public health nurses who are going out into the field where people who live unsheltered are, um, organizations like Healthcare for the Homeless, do those individuals have the authority if they find people who are symptomatic? Um, are they considered a healthcare professional uh, as, as it relates to the CDC um, criteria uh, for testing? And that's it. Thanks. So uh, I'll have to get back to you on the actual number of uh, hygiene kits distributed. Um, and, uh, you know, related to the hygiene uh, and sanitation guidelines, uh, I mentioned two ways that the city is uh, uh, involved. Uh, one, uh, in partnership with King County uh, DCHS and Public Health, we're going to be providing uh, trainings to uh, providers uh, so that they uh, uh, have a deep level of understanding of the guidelines and why they're in place. Um, uh, those trainings also include a time of Q&A so that people can uh, really understand and try to uh, start asking questions about uh, how those guidelines can be operationalized. Um, so that's a level of technical assistance that the city will be providing, again, in partnership with King County and, and, and public health. Um, we are also, um, uh, I, I believe I mentioned, uh, making a large order uh, in coordination with King County through our EOCs. Uh, and that's specifically so that uh, uh, providers have the materials they need in order to uh, adhere to the, the sanitation and hygiene guidelines. Thank you. That's helpful. Uh, I did not so realize we are not, that providers uh, had access. making a um, cash or fund uh, available for them to do the purchase. Uh, we figured that it would be uh, uh, a lot faster uh, and um, uh, potentially done even more cheaply for us to do a, a bulk purchase of, uh, uh, of materials through our EOCs. And both the city and the county uh, have made the same request through our EOCs for those materials. Thanks. Uh, uh, on, on testing, uh, I'll admit that I don't have the specifics of exactly who uh, can um, uh, uh, sort of mandate or initiate uh, that someone uh, be tested, but I will uh, offer that um, Healthcare for the Homeless has been a great partner to us, uh, is, is deeply engaged, and um, you know, we know that um, uh, uh, many of the unsheltered population use the medical services that exist inside of shelters, that exist as part of outreach teams, that exist as part of the public health clinics. Uh, and so all of those providers uh, are, are really leaning in and making sure that they are aware both of guidance, but also aware of the conditions that uh, people are presenting when they go into those facilities. Perfect. I just want to know whether or not those providers, uh, and I understand you don't know the I answer understand. now, yep. uh, but whether or not those providers are authorized to, um, to uh, get testing for the people that they come in, in contact with. Thank you. Any additional questions for Interim Director Johnson? Uh, 
Director Johnson, thank you so much for that summary. Um, Deputy Mayor, any additional context to add? Yeah. Okay. Um, I do appreciate the message that came from the mayor's office a few moments before we started this hearing this afternoon, um, talking about how we were expanding access to shelter for folks. Obviously, we'll want to continue working with you to continue to do so. That's no surprise from this council. Um, but I appreciate the way that this was um, phrased. We want to dispel any myths that are out there about people in um, inappropriately assigning um, this virus with those who are living unsheltered. That is absolutely not the case. As Councilmember Herbal mentioned before, this virus knows um, no race and gender and um, race or ethnicity uh, we, or class. And we want to make sure that those who are in the position of not having a home because we haven't provided enough housing in this city or region and those who don't have access to health care because we don't have universal health care, that we <laughs> do what we need to do, especially in this crisis, to provide them with access to care and to housing. So thank you for stepping up those efforts and helping to dispel that myth, that myth as well. Is there anybody else on the panel that has not had a chance to speak that would like to still? No, Council Member, I think we've concluded. Council colleagues, any additional comments or questions? Okay. Thank you so much um, for all of you for being here. Please extend our appreciation to your frontline staff, and um, that includes the folks at the parks. Uh, I didn't get a chance to hear from you, Mr. Giddy, so thanks for being here. Um, and with that, we are going to go ahead and, and move into public comment. Before I do that, I need to adopt the proposed agenda for today. I'd like to move to adopt the proposed agenda for today's meeting. Okay. It's been moved and seconded. If there's no objection, the agenda will be amended to revise the order of business to both have public comment now and then our executive session. Hearing no objection, the agenda is amended. All those in favor of approving the agenda as amended, please vote aye and raise your hand. Aye. 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 Any opposition? Nobody voted no. The motion carries. The agenda is amended, and we do have one person signed up for public comment. David, thank you for waiting. David Haynes is here. You have two minutes. Thank you so much, David. A hot, a hotline, son. One second, David. Try again, please. A hotline, 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. doesn't seem so 24-7 urgent. Spraying chemical only adds to the cancer-causing concerns, especially if not wiping down One second, down David. Just let me. Folks, so sorry. We have one person doing public comment. If we could keep the volume down. David, you can start your comment over. It's appalling and a stalling of progress when a public safety committee who exempts drug pushers from jail, who destroy lives and imploded society, are in charge of public response to the virus. And so far, their public health expertise has come up with hand-washing stations and delays while promising more money to political supporters for testing. Yet you can't get out of the library bathroom or the computers or the bus without touching something nasty, while hiring practices fail to hire those to clean proper. And what about the homeless who can't even get proper shower services, the shelters? That's, this justifies an investigation of social service providers. All this while council policies offer treasonous and unconstitution, unconstitutional open border sanctuary for customs violators, foreign and domestic, who need more than multilingual education in coughing and sneezing etiquette, because some people sit right behind you on the bus while leaning as close to bus rider in front of them as possible and coughs or sneezes as if they're trying to get you sick. Maybe we need laws to stop the stall in progress while evil disease predators at the bus stop on 105th and Aurora are walking around the bus stop spitting into the wind and on people while the cops and rapid ride security refuse to show up because the guy didn't have any weapons. Perhaps we need to do more than teach people how to cough and wash hands and emphasize never touch the sink handle, the door handle, or the toilet seat because evil junkies splattering blood shooting up heroin is more of a public safety threat than things council responds to that get on international news. Seattle seems to get excited when they have first deaths in the U.S. to get Seattle in the national news, but it doesn't distract from the fact council has already imploded society and endangers the first world innocence, proving we don't have well-adjusted, trustworthy council leadership at the helm of public safety. Perhaps councils, anyway, uh, drinking and thinking derails progress. The last council president proved that. Thank you, David. Is there anybody else who would like to provide public comment today? 
Okay, seeing none, council colleagues, the council will be at ease until our presenters for the executive session arrive. The council's at ease.
Hello again, everyone. It is 3.02 on March 5th. As presiding officer, I'm announcing the Seattle City Council will now convene in executive session. The purpose of this executive session is to discuss pending or potential litigation. The council's executive sessions are an opportunity for the council to discuss confidential legal matters with the city attorneys as authorized by law. A legal monitor from the city attorney's office is always present to ensure the council reserves questions of policy for open session. I expect the executive session to end by 345. If the executive session is ex extended beyond that time, I will announce the extension and the expected duration. Thank you very much, everyone who is not on the list of approved folks to be in the room. Please clear the room. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Good afternoon. Again, this is March 5th, 2020, and it's a special meeting of the Seattle City Council. It's 4.24 p.m., and the Seattle City Council has been in recess. We are now bringing the council meeting back to open session. Will the clerk please call the roll? Peterson. Here. Sawat. Strauss. Present. Herbold. Here. Juarez. Lewis. Here. Present. Morales. Here. Council President Pro Tem Mosqueda. Here. Seven present. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Council Member Juarez, for being with us in, um, in this meeting as well via phone. And thank you, Council Member Sawant, for joining us as well. The city, will, the city Council will now proceed with agenda item number one. Um, before we do that, Madam Clerk, before you read it into the record, I do want to just take a few moments. Um, Council, uh, Council Member Herbold, I appreciate your organization of the panel this morning. You did a tremendous job of pulling together deputy mayors and uh, directors so that we could have a real-time update on the public health implementation efforts. Um, did you have any comments or reflections in retrospect? No, I uh, want to thank everybody's participation, uh, not just uh, today in the meeting itself, but also uh, in providing your questions in advance. I think it allowed us um, as a council to uh, drill deeper um, after receiving answers to questions, um, because as we know, um, answers to questions usually provoke more questions. So um, it really allowed us to, to do that, and that couldn't have been possible without um, the assistance and collaboration of everybody up here and your staff. Thank you. Any other colleagues have any comments or questions about what we heard earlier today? Okay. There's a few takeaway items that I wanted to note in terms of data that had been requested. Uh, the total number of individuals who have been tested in King County from Councilmember Herbold, the number or amount of cleaning supplies that we need to order to meet our city's, uh, city employees' needs, including those who are doing uh, janitorial work. Um, you had a question about hygiene kits and how many of those had been distributed across our city, especially with the navigation team's effort to um, hopefully do less sweeping and more assisting um, as they're getting word out to individuals who are unhoused. And then you had an important question about who can initiate the testing, uh, such as HSD providers, if the organizational um, teams see individuals who they believe may meet the criteria. And let's also note the adapted criteria as it has been offered additional flexibility from the CDC. So as new cases potentially um, come into our community, we want our organizations who have that trusted partnership with them, with the community they see to be able to recommend testing. Um, I want to take a minute to also thank our incredible team who's the um, clerk's office and the central staff. We have over the last 24 to 48 hours been trying to quickly respond to the need to both address the proclamation in front of us, the order that has been um, submitted by the mayor, and to also respond with various questions and concerns uh, from this council. So we appreciate the work that you all have done in the last uh, 24 and 48 hours as we got prepared for this conversation. We're going to have a chance to hear from central staff here in a moment who is bringing materials for our afternoon's conversation or the final item on our afternoon's agenda. And 
as we do that, I also want to acknowledge um, that we have the mayor's office here with us. So thank you very much for being here, Anthony, and uh, please extend our appreciation to the mayor for having her executive team here this afternoon to provide us with a briefing um, and to public health as well. We appreciate you being here. Uh, Madam Clerk, I think what we will do is we are going to read item number one into the record. And as we do, we would ask our central staff um, team to join us at the table, uh, hoping that we have had an opportunity for folks to have all their questions answered by the de department directors um, and to really bring forward those questions that we heard from frontline staff and community members. I know that the community has sent in a number of questions and comments that we had uh, a desire to get in front of the executive team and throughout your presentation today, and the questions that we've asked at the table and both sent to the mayor's office, uh, we've been able to get some answers in real time and there will continue to be questions that I know our community members um, would like to bring forward. As a reminder, we're asking folks if they have questions from the media to please call the Information Center at 206-233-5072. And for members of the public, if you have not yet signed up for <coughs> Alert Seattle for real time and customized notifications, um, you can get those via text, email, and voice message and social media at um, alert.seattle.gov, um, alert.seattle.gov. So with that, I um, want to turn it back over to our clerks to read agenda item number one into the record. Agenda item one, resolution 31937, a resolution modifying the March 3rd, 2020 Merrill Proclamation of Civil Emergency related to the spread of COVID-19 novel cor coronavirus. Thank you, Madam Clerk. So, Council Members, before we consider possible revisions to the resolution, I'm going to move the resolution so that it is before us and then suspend the rules to allow for Central Staff, Ketel Freeman, uh, to provide us with an overview of the resolution and the proposed substitute. So, I move to adopt Resolution 31937. Second. The resolution has been moved and seconded. If there's no objection, the Council rules will be suspended to allow Ketel Freeman to address the Council. Hearing no objection, the council rules are suspended. Keto, thank you very much for being here. I hope you heard our notes of appreciation for you as you've been working over, around the clock to get the um, amendments in front of us. Could you please introduce yourself for the record and then begin with an overview of the resolution and then we'll talk about the proposed substitute. Sure. Um, Keto Freeman, Council Central Staff. Um, so, as the uh, council knows, on, on March 3rd, uh, Mayor Durkin proclaimed a civil emergency related to the spread of COVID-19, which is otherwise known as um, a novel coronavirus. Um, that proclamation includes orders um, that allow the mayor to assume authority um, uh, to bypass existing laws, regulations, and policies in the interest of protecting the public health, safety, and welfare. Um, the laws and regulations that the mayor um, could bypass are primarily related to um, uh, uh, budget, contracting, purchasing, and regulation of land use and, con and construction, including um, uh, this, uh, the city's application of the State Environmental Policy Act. Um, pursuant to um, Chapter 1002 of the Seattle Municipal Code, when the mayor proclaims a civil emergency and issues orders pursuant to that emergency, within 48 hours, the council may, by resolution, ratify and confirm the mayor's action, modify the mayor's action, or reject the mayor's action. Um, uh, Council Member uh, Mosqueda proposes uh, to modify uh, the mayor's proposed action. I'll walk through um, how uh, Resolution 31739 would do that. Um, so turning to that resolution and the modified proclamation, um, uh, a civil emergency, when there is a civil emergency, the council cedes power. So it is necessarily a trust but verify exercise for the council. Um, and that's reflected in um, uh, the proposed uh, substitute resolution and proclamation. Um, I'll talk through a little bit of the mechanics of the legislation here. The proclamation and orders in that proclamation establish the civil emergency and enumerate those powers the mayor is assuming. Um, the assumption of power allows her to bypass, as I mentioned, um, uh, otherwise applicable laws and regulations. Um, the council can limit her assumption of power um, by modifying the proclamation in order, but the council can't um, prescribe that she take actions that would otherwise be in her discretion. 
Um, for that, um, the council um, can establish expectations uh, so that um, uh, the mayor understands uh, what sort of information the council needs um, to act on future orders and also to continue the civil emergency. So I'll turn here to um, uh, proposed modifications to the proclamation. Um, so the modifications to the proclamation um, are, are in many ways clarifications, but also um, some um, restrictions on, on some powers the mayor proposes to invoke. Uh, turning here to uh, page two of uh, the mayor's proclamation, uh, the council clarifies that um, uh, the authority that she um, is assuming um, uh, is limited to uh, state budget laws, uh, striking reference to RCW and the adopted city budget. Um, uh, the uh, uh, substitute proposed by uh, Council Member Mosqueda affirms um, that the mayor will comply with code required um, state of emergency reporting um, requirements on uh, spending and contracting. Um, it affirms that future orders will comply with formal requirements um, that are prescribed by the Seattle Municipal Code um, that are largely intended to uh, protect civil rights and help the council understand how future orders might infringe civil rights. Clarifies that the delegation of authority to the police and fire chiefs is pursuant to current law um, unless authorized by a future order. Um, and it also uh, strikes reference in the delegation section of the order um, to other departments and personnel will assist as requested. So um, the order delegates to the fire chief and police chief um, authority to um, uh, implement certain laws, which they already have the authority to do, um, but it uh, strikes a surplusage of the language about other departments and personnel. And finally, it eliminates um, what's largely a, a boilerplate reference to a charter provision um, that recites that the mayor has sole authority over the police department in times of emergency, uh, which is true in all circumstances. So questions, council members? Keetal, thank you very much for walking us through the edits to the proclamation. Would it be helpful if we took questions on that, if there are any at this point, before moving on to the resolution? Council colleagues, any questions on the amended uh, proclamation that we have in front of us for consideration? Comments? See, uh, see. Or questions? Uh, we can do uh, comments if you like, or if you want to him to go through the both of them and then as a package, we can consider comments if that'd be appropriate. Thank you, Council Member Peterson. Questions, yes. Um, I just want uh, for um, folks who may be following along, I uh, was hoping that um, Keto Freeman could offer just a little bit more clarity on the difference between uh, the language that was proposed um, as it relates to the uh, powers being granted the mayor related to the budget um, and what the council is offering um, as new language. Um, I, think, uh, I think it's fair to say that this is um, more um, a clarification, but I think if people were to just read it without more uh, more understanding, um, it might seem like we are um, putting some limits that I don't think we intend to put. Sure, yeah, so the section three of the proclamation um, lists uh, limitations um, uh, that the mayor is assuming authority to bypass. And um, those limitations include um, limitations that are present in our contracting requirements and other uh, state and local requirements. Um, from what I understand, there is ambiguity in state law about um, what authority the mayor or mayors may have depending on um, what type of jurisdiction it is and states of emergency. Um, so this um, uh, resolves that ambiguity in part by pointing to general budget law. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Any additional questions on the mayoral proclamation and the suggested edits? Seeing none. Uh, Keetle, do you mind walking us through the resolution that would accompany this? Sure. So as I mentioned, um, 
uh, a council decision on a mayor on a mayoral proclamation of a civil emergency is an, is a trust but verify exercise. Um, so uh, the um, limitations on uh, the mayor's exercise of emergency authority and the proclamation, um, the expectations that the council has uh, for how she will use her authority um, and how the city um, will act as um, this emergency evolves are contained in the body of the resolution. So I'll walk through each section of the resolution. Um, of the proposed uh, substitute resolution. Uh, the first section um, modifies uh, the proclamation as I just described. Um, the second section wow. requests that the mayor make expenditures pursuant to her emergency authority that are consistent um, uh, with council priorities. And those priorities include investments in hand washing stations, investment in hygiene services, and as you all will recall, the, the council made some appropriations for mobile pit stops as part of the 2020 adopted budget. Um, investments that increase the access um, uh, of lower income households to COVID-19 testing and investments in culturally and linguistically appropriate um, outreach materials for limited English proficiency speakers. Question, uh, oh, excuse me, continue please. So moving on to section three of uh, the proposed substitute resolution, this section um, uh, establishes the council's expectations for additional actions that the mayor uh, may take uh, um, uh, to address the spread of COVID-19. Um, uh, those actions include amendments to city personnel policies and collective bargaining agreements to clarify um, working conditions for city employees, um, reviewing options for city staff and contractors to take paid uh, days off um, if, their leaves run, if their leave runs out, um, an analysis of the race and social justice impl implications of uh, the mayor's exercise of emergency authority, um, consideration, um, and a recommendation to council on, on how the state of emergency is impacting uh, homeless communities. Um, and finally, um, potentially issuance of an order, not finally, the two, th two remaining things. One is issuance of an order um, related to economic controls and price stabilization. This is something that Deputy Mayor Fong alluded to in his presentation to the council. And finally, identification that the, city's, that the city can take to um, encourage better working conditions and discourage uh, for, for non-city employees. Sorry, um, Keetal, it just trailed off a little bit there at the end. Can you sure. say that last yeah, sentence so, again? Uh, uh, subsection F of section three um, addresses um, steps the city can take to encourage um, non-city um, employees to provide uh, working, uh, safe working conditions for their employees um, during the civil emergency and also discourages actions the city can take to discourage uh, private sector employees from taking punitive actions against employees who um, uh, don't come to work for public health reasons. The section four, oh, pardon me, uh, Councilmember Herbold, it looks like you may have had a question. Thank you. Um, I just want to speak to, um, Thank you, two items um, under section three. Um, the first being um, the language related to um, telecommuting. Um, I recognize that um, we are uh, giving direction to employees here in the city and the county is also giving direction uh, to employees in the, in the county um, about telecommuting and that there's been concern from, uh, from uh, labor representing our employees that um, we really need to have um, our policies around telecommuting be aligned um, and so this is an this is an effort to get at that that need um, I think the uh, directive that came out of um, the mayor's office around telecommuting um, might have inadvertently created some confusion uh, when compared to the directive coming out of out of King County related to telecommuting and this is intended to, to address that issue. Um, as it relates specifically to um, uh, items, the items listed under um, section F, um, I would like to signal uh, my interest in working um, with the chair of the Labor Committee um, in potentially having a future action, uh, a, a resolution in the, in the hopefully very near future because this is all related um, to um, this potential pandemic um, as it relates specifically to what we would really like to see uh, private employers do um, as it relates to the service, um, service sector um, uh, workers, uh, particularly um, service sector workers that are in the gig economy. Thank you, Councilmember Herbold. I look forward to that future conversation. 
Thank you, Kirill. Um, sure. do you, would, would you like to continue? Sure. So uh, section four of the proposed substitute um, telegraphs uh, the council's intent when it comes to future orders that may um, infringe on civil liberties. Um, it is the case in any uh, civil emergency that there is the potential uh, for the government to en enact orders that infringe on civil liberties. A classic example is something like a curfew. Um, uh, this section uh, telegraphs to the mayor that any order infringing civil liberties will be viewed through a lens that incorporates um, evidence-based public health practices and um, an analysis of whether or not the, um, uh, uh, infringed the infringement is the least restriction necessary to accomplish the public health safety and welfare objective. Um, Any questions? Questions? All right, moving on to section five. Uh, this is a reporting section. So um, the mayor has a duty to uh, report to the council through FAS about uh, contracts um, and obligations that are incurred pursuant to her exercise of emergency authority. That reporting is required after the state of emergency. Um, so these are reporting requ requirements that would apply during the state of emergency with the first report submitted to the council by March 20th. Um, reports would include information on emergency expenditures by department, uh, new contracts entered into or amendments to existing contracts, uh, new permanent or term limited uh, positions added or empty positions filled to address the civil emergency, um, information that will help the council understand uh, to what extent uh, enforcement of existing uh, criminal and uh, uh, civil laws are, are being um, enforced differently um, to address the civil emergency. And also, um, each action taken, an identification for each action taken by the mayor of the limitation that from city code, um, adopted city policy, um, state code or regulation um, that the mayor um, bypassed uh, to accomplish um, that action. And then finally, um, section six establishes the council's intent uh, to consider whether to continue the civil emergency and modify any current orders um, by a date certain, and that date certain is April 5th. Thank you, Kito. Any comments or question or any co any questions at this point? Seeing none, Kittle, is there anything else that you'd like to say about the resolution in front of us? Uh, no. Okay. So, council colleagues, I would like to uh, first move that we get the amended resolution in front of us, and then potentially consider additional comments, and then a vote if that pleases the body. Ketel, again, I want to say thank you to you and your other colleagues who've been working on the resolution and um, the mayor's proclamation edits. Uh, really appreciate your quick work on that. I would like to move to amend resolution 31937 by substituting version 2B for version 1B, which also includes the new Exhibit B. Colleagues, Exhibit B is the mayor's proclamation as amended as described by Ketel. Version 2C. Okay. Just a quick clarification here. It's version 2C, not 2B. So let me do that again for the record. I move to amend resolution 31937 by substituting version 2C for version 1B, which includes new exhibit B, which is the mayor's proclamation. Second. It's been moved and seconded that seconded to amend the resolution. We now have a proposed substitute to the resolution um, in front of us, and that it also includes Exhibit B as described, which modifies the mayor's civil emergency proclamation. I'd like to see if there's any comments from the body, um, because I don't believe that we have any proposed amendments to consider. Seeing no amendments, I'd love to entertain any comments from the body before we move to consider votes. Council colleagues? When the proclamation or the resolution? Do you want to do them both together? Um, I, I'm asking for which for which are you asking for comments on? Right? Um, so, Councilmember Herbold, I think it's a great question. Since resolution goes with Exhibit B, which is the proclamation, um, I'd love for folks if they have comments to address uh, them at this time together. You can say if you're speaking to the resolution, um, which has a lot of the council's directive in it, or you can talk about the amendments or the underlying uh, proclamation that the mayor has issued and the amendments we made to that, which for the record, again, is the exhibit B. 
So, Councilmember Herbold, would you like to start us off? Sure. Um, I just want to say, first of all, generally, um, uh, I really appreciate my colleagues, um, the time and effort and care they've put into this work product. Um, I think it reflects um, the priorities that we have, um, but that also it reflects the concerns that the, that the public has. I, I really appreciate um, the efforts of the executive as well um, to work through some of these amendments with us. And I want to speak specifically to um, the items in the resolution in sections uh, two through D. Um, we are, uh, with the proclamation, um, agreeing um, with the use of the mayor's um, power to expedite um, the purchase of items that are critical uh, to addressing um, the uh, spread of the virus and limiting the spread of the virus, which is a, um, a really an, an important mission critical objective that we all have right now. Um, and I just, um, as it relates uh, to the fact that we are uh, eliminating the requirement of the mayor to have to go through some of the contracting and procurement practices, uh, advertising practices that normally they would have to. Um, I would also encourage when it, when it comes to um, purchases that there might be some policy work that has to be done in order to implement the use of those purchases. I, I, I want to make sure that we're doing those things together moving forward. I'm concerned that as it relates specifically to the mobile pit stops, that there is a um, um, it, there appears to be a belief on the part of the executive that we have to work out all the policy decision making um, around the siting and location um, and staffing of the mobile pit stops before we begin procurement. And I think we can do those things together and we must do those things together. Um, we, um, there's lots of good policy that, um, that are public health best practices that are being used in places like Los Angeles, San Diego, and San Francisco as it relates to the deployment of the mobile pit stops. We do not have to reinvent the wheel. Um, and I, want, I really want to emphasize uh, how important I think it is to move forward with pro procurement of mobile pit stops as soon as possible while we are simultaneously developing the policy associated with their use. Thank you, Council Member Hurl. Then thank you for the amendments that you made to help make sure that that information was clarified, both in the resolution and the language that you've also suggested for the proclamation. Council Member Sawan. Thank you, President um, Mosquito. <clears throat> I intend to support this declaration of emergency because, of course, the coronavirus is an emergency, especially with the Seattle region being, as they've said, ground zero. The resolution, as has been discussed, uh, uh, contains a language that, uh, that, we, uh, that we want to make sure, as a, as a legislative body, protects uh, all the interests of uh, the constituents of this city. And it says that the public health goals of the mayor's proclamation should be carried out with the least restrictions on civil liberties and consistent with public health evidence. I think it's important to state that. And, and I just want to um, make a spe spe special mention of the, the fact that um, the, the city council expects that, uh, uh, as, a, as a specific example of uh, the treatment of homeless uh, neighbors, that the public health goals are, uh, and public health assistance is, um, is the goal and not uh, policing of, or in, in any other way violating the rights of homeless individuals. And I think that is very important to point out because our homeless neighbors are also the most vulnerable health-wise and they have weakened immune system. And we have to make sure, as the council has done throughout the day, that uh, we do that with uh, every sense of social responsibility and with zero stigma. Mm -hmm. I think that's very important. Um, uh, as many of you uh, are aware, of course, the, the problems we face are uh, obviously the most emergent problem is related to the pandemic, but the, but the control of this pandemic is very much 
related to the healthcare system that we have in the country and a large proportion of our population is not just in Seattle but nationwide is uninsured or underinsured and as many of you have seen I sent a letter to the mayor and the King County executive that uh, that is the main uh, restriction that has to be addressed which is the problem that many people cannot get tested or get the related medical care because they are either uninsured or underinsured i'm happy to see that governor insley under the emergency throughout the state has declared today that the uninsured in our state will have free testing and we've also had an emergency order sent to washington health insurance uh, providers to make sure that individuals who are insured, but clearly many of them are underinsured, that uh, they will be covered for testing without copays or deductibles, or they should be covered by copays or deductibles. And in addition to that, individuals will be able to have a one-time refill on their prescriptions as part of that emergency order. I think these are all important uh, developments that have happened, but they also point towards the fact that we don't have the benefit of a nationwide Medicare for all single payer healthcare system. Uh, and we can get the idea of what is possible through how different countries are dealing with the aftermath of this pandemic. South Korea, for example, has a Medicare for all like system and has used it to provide free drive through coronavirus testing for anyone who wants it, even for people who do not have symptoms. And, and in fact, they do it in a very, uh, a very effective manner where they protect the health of the medical professionals as well, the way they do it in sh shifts with safety suits, and it makes sure that uh, the health professionals themselves are not impacted because that also impacts public health overall. With over 500 drive-through testing sites, South Korea has tested over 100,000 people. So far, it, it, it's really glaring, the, the contrast with the United States where as of yesterday, I mean, maybe it's more now, but as of yesterday, 500 total people in the U.S. Have, has been, have been tested. Uh, it's really uh, important to hear that the virology department at the University of Washington has now developed a new diagnostic test under FDA controls that will allow them to test 1,000 samples a day. So this is important. But I just wanted to give a sense of the numbers. If you uh, look at, uh, if you compare South Korea's numbers to the number 500, which we had yesterday in the United States, it means that you are over 1,200 times more likely to have access to a coronavirus test in South Korea than in the United States. And keeping in mind, especially that South Korea and the United States got the coronavirus, at least as far as we know, on the same day. As Yale, Yale health, healthcare expert Howard Foreman has said, it is well within the realm of possibility that there are 100,000 people infected with this right now in the United States. And so on the one hand, we don't want our uh, constituents to panic. On the other hand, we also want to deal with uh, the seriousness that it deserves. And we know that the outcomes of a system that prioritizes the profits of a few in the insurance, pharmaceutical, and health management industries are often tragic in normal circumstances. But in the context of a global pandemic, the anarchy of this for-profit system could be lethal to many in our society. So I really just wanted to end by saying that this is uh, such an important case for Medicare for All. Thank you very much for bringing that point up. Thank you. Councilmember Peterson. Yes, thank you, Chair. I agree with the mayor that the public health situation is an emergency, and I want to thank the mayor for taking the initiative to issue this proclamation of civil emergency. I'm also pleased to support these helpful clarifications that the council is about to make to the proclamation. The companion resolution, in my interpretation, it makes um, very productive requests rather than reducing the mayor's flexibility in addressing the emergency. And the requests include uh, increasing the frequency of official reports that we will all receive during this evolving emergency. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councilmember Peterson. Any other council colleagues would like to say anything? Councilmember Juarez, uh, I don't want to skip over you. If there's anything you'd like to say, please chime in at any point. Um, I'll just say another quick uh, note of appreciation. Uh, we are working as fast as possible to try to get this information in front of us. Oh, and I will chime in, but I'm good. <laughs> Thank you, Councilmember Juarez. Um, and uh, as, as I turn it over to Councilmember Morales here in a second, I do also want to just say thanks to Sejal Parikh, Chief of Staff in our office, who've been working around the clock on these proclamations and uh, revisions as well. Appreciate your work on this. Councilmember Morales. 
I want to make sure folks understand that uh, this proclamation is issued by the mayor, um, but the council will be reviewing, receiving weekly reports, and the uh, proclamation is rescinded by the council. So it has to be by two-thirds vote, um, but we will be reviewing on a weekly basis the status of the epidemic and our ability to respond. Um, and when folks in the city agree that it's time, uh, that's how the proclamation will be rescinded, is by the city council making a two-thirds vote. Excellent point. Thank you, Councilmember Morales. Seeing no other comments, the last comment I want to um, say is, again, our appreciation for the quick work for the folks on the ground. We talked to some of the uh, department directors today, but we know it's the frontline workers, the firefighters, the human service department workers, the long-term care providers, those who are contract workers and those who are janitorial workers who are really um, putting themselves out there and putting themselves at risk um, for both helping to make sure that the are most vulnerable in our community have what they need and that are they're also protected in a time like this so we always want to honor their work but especially in times like this my hope is that the process for expediting contracts and, per and purchasing that is clearly articulated in this uh, resolution and executive order will help to make sure that people have the equipment they need, the masks, the gloves, anything like that for our workers. We know we don't want people to inadvertently go out there and purchase masks because those should be actually saved for those who are ill and our medical frontline providers. Um, we want to make sure that our workers have what they need and I think this, this contracting procurement process outlined in here gives me hope that we can get hand washing facilities across the city in a very quick way. Um, I also think that we've done a lot in this pro proclamation to protect workers across the city. We want there to be flexibility and it also ensuring there's flexibility. We don't want to waive any of our protections for the safety and health of our city employees. So thanks to all of you for your incredible work on these amendments and looking forward to continuing to work with the executive, the departments that were here, public health and King County. With that, Seeing no additional comments, all of those in favor of, of substitute resolution 31937, which is version 2C and exhibit B, please vote aye and raise your hand. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing none. The motion carries. The resolution is amended. Are there any other comments on the amended resolution? Okay. Aye. Thank you, Councilmember Juarez. All those in favor of adopting the resolution as amended, please vote aye and raise your hand. Aye. 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 Councilmember Morris. I believe she's on mute. Aye. Thank you, Councilmember Morris. Any opposed? None. The motion carries. The resolution is amended. Aye. Thank you, Councilmember Morris. The chair will sign it. The resolution will be filed with the mayor for distribution to the governor, King County Executive, and other required recipients. <laughs> <laughs> if there's no other comments, again, thanks to central staff um, and the incredible work of our, our folks on the floor, in addition to the folks who were at the table today. Appreciate all your work. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you.